get underway, I'm going to ask um, uh, Councillor Rainey to begin us with a karakia. Uh, thanks, Mr. Nick. I thought I'd just um, uh, give the English translation first. Let the strength and life force of our ancestors be with each and every one of us, freeing our path from the destruction so that our words, spiritual power, love and language are upheld, permanently fixed, established and understood. Forward, together. Ki a tau ngā manaakitanga a te mau ngārau, ki runga, ki tēnā, ki tēnā o tātou, ki a mahe a te hua makihiki, ki a toi te kupu, toi te mana, toi te aroha, toi te reo Māori, ki a tuturu ka whakamoa, ki a tīna, tīna, huie, tai kia. Thanks, Councillor Rani. Uh, can I give a very warm welcome to our youth councillor, uh, Finn, uh, and look forward to your uh, contributions uh, to today. I do know that uh, Councillor Benj uh, is uh, zooming in, uh, and I'm going to ask the Deputy Mayor just to help me keep an eye on the screen to make sure that uh, enable uh, his uh, participation. Um, I have made some adjustments to the programme um, of the agenda. Um, our Senior Manager, Andrew White, uh, has a bereavement this afternoon, so I just want to bring his items forward on the agenda. That means I'm going to bring items 12 and 13 early on the programme uh, to enable him to be able to take that bereavement leave. I also, just in opening today's council meeting, want to acknowledge uh, that it is a full year uh, since Nigel Fulpot became our Thank Chief you. Executive. I do want to note uh, that when he was appointed to the role, he committed a cardinal sin. He sent me yes. a photo of him celebrating his appointment with a bottle of Hawke's Bay wine in front of uh, him and his wife. And uh, I reminded him of his duties to be an unassailing, always advocate for Nelson. Uh, I think all of us would acknowledge that Nigel uh, has contributed to this community and council very well over the last 12 months. And just so he never repeats the error again, I have a bottle of Seyfried's Nelson wine, and I want him to know that if he's seen anything other, uh, he will be docking his pay. Nigel, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, As I always like to do, I do like to correct the mayor every time, every now and then. And actually, it wasn't a bottle of uh, from where from. In fact, it's actually from the Tasman. So it was, it was in the spirit of partnership oh. between Nelson and Tasman that I was drinking a, a, a bottle of wine from from the Marpoa region. But always, always to be corrected, as so often over the last twelve months uh, by the chief executive. Thanks, sir. Very kind. Uh, can I just uh, note, are there any interests uh, that everybody, anybody wishes to declare specifically for the uh, agenda uh, for today? And I've just received an apology for Councillor Benji, just going to be 10 minutes late coming onto the call. Any interests specific to today's agenda? That being the case, we move to public forum and I invite Alison Croft from the Intergenerational Playgrounds to a presentation. Please join us at the table. Good morning, all. It's so nice to be here. It's nice uh, and it's a real privilege um, to have this forum. I think it's amazing. And I'm going to be speaking about intergenerational or multi-generational um, playgrounds. But I'll start off with my real passion, which is, I have to tell you, I am a swinger and there's not a nightclub in sight. <laughs> there's just me on the swings, playground swings. <laughs> You've got and me worried already. <laughs> uh, there. Anyway, um, I've been swinging virtually all my life. I didn't stop when, you know, children, they learn how to swing. I was a preschool teacher for 30 years and um, it was a big thing on my heart and most kindergartens and preschools to get the children to learn how to swing by themselves. Why? Why do we teach children how to swing? Then once they do swing, oh, well, you've done that, just, you know, you, you probably won't do it any, anymore, you know, especially the youth. I mean, the swings I use down near Broad Green Intermediate and Nayland, um, they're in the um, Neil Ave Park, 
wonderful swings, two baby swings or kind of thing. And then 30 meters away, this is what I'm saying, safe is safe is safe. It's the two swings that I can use. Lovely long um, chains and my swing has been covered for me um, with a lovely thick tubular um, covering that only needs to go up about halfway because you hold the swing there. Um, but when, when I go to use my swing sometimes, the kids from Broad Green or Nayland College will be sitting on the swings with their devices, not actually swinging. But if, <laughs> how dare they? But anyway, I sometimes talk to them and, and they move off and say how important it is because I do swinging 10 minutes every day when I'm living in when I'm Nelson because I spend a bit of time overseas each year. But anyway, and it is, I just don't swing like that. I do exercises because you can do exercises on swings, which are very good for your core, you know, um, muscles and um also I, I lean right back i'm totally straight horizontal on the swing and i lean right back so my head almost hits the ground but it doesn't because i know exactly when to lift my head because anyhow it, swinging is good for everybody why do we stop swinging is it because the social um values of the they say, oh, that's kids' stuff. No, it isn't kids' stuff. It needs to be mainstream for everyone. So this is, I'm calling out for all the swings in Nelson to be covered with this nice um, tubular thing because it, doing my swinging without on the ch using the chains, it just is so hard on my hands. And also, in its winter time, the, the lovely rubber is makes it much more warm to to use. So um, that's my uh, yes. That's that's what I am really. And also another thing about swings, I've noticed. That, you know, there's been they've unearthed and in, in Greece evidence of swinging swinging apparatus from 1450 BC. So people have been swinging all that time. And so what's happening, I find, not so much in Nelson, but when I go around, I find these flash playgrounds and they've got no swings because swings and, and the kindergartens are taking out their swings because they are, yes, they are jolly, can be dangerous. But, um, we must stick with ordinary swings because recently I went to, to a beach in on Golden Bay. We go there every year for six years we've been going and I go straight to the swings. Well, they were there, but they're not there anymore. These ordinary swings with chains, unfortunately, I take my thick gloves, um, they have replaced it with a tiny sort of children's play ground with a swing that is like rubber, a rubber um, bicycle wheel with three um, rope, ropes or chains. And there's no way I can get on there. There's no way any adult can get on there. And, and the big swings, as I used to go to the proper swings, they've been taken. And the playground as it was before, the other items have been taken away as well and not there anymore. So we need to stick with good swings and we need to make them available for um, adults, more, more um, conducive towards adults using them because the swings I use at the Neil Ave Park, they just fit my derriere, my bum, on the on the um, rubber, nice soft rubber um, seating. But if other people my age or larger than me were to use it, they wouldn't be able to get there, be able to use it. Thank um, you.
it's easy to say. So it's very important. Inclusive, inclusivity. Because old people, old, because I'm 74, but in Christ, it's been a real movement to get an adult-only playground, no children allowed. Well, that does not ring with me. Apparently, down in Christchurch, the Margaret Mayhe um, oh, Park um, Great Playground, when the children go home, the oldies come out. And did you know that it's been nine, in 2020, there were 900 applications for ACC, you know, um, help because people, oldies over, over 50 or over 60, had hurt themselves when they were out um, on using Margaret Mayhew Playground. But I would suggest... I'm going to need to wrap you up there, Alison. What's that? You've gone over your time. I need to, you to conclude, please. But I haven't heard... It's, OK. We've had, you've had both the one bell and the two bells. Oh, don't I don't want to be rude, nothing. but but, Sorry. but want you to conclude your comments if you can. Oh, thank you. Well, very quickly, because I've... I broke my second hearing aid yesterday and only using one. I suppose, but anyway. Um, Was there anything else that you were that wished to add before you conclude? See, I can't hear, Nick. No. <laughs> okay, so my, I just want to praise um, whoever is in, in control of the infrastructure yeah. for playgrounds. The, the swings are excellent, except for the fact they haven't got the tubes. So, um, but um, so, yeah, um, it's just yes. inclusivity because I had a request from a woman yesterday whose child is in, whose girl is in a wheelchair, and she was talking about the Saxton Field um, one, Saxton Field playground that is in the ten year draft, and she, and so she, I thought oh, I mentioned her today because when we talk about inclusivity, we talk about the disabled as well, but. Yeah, this um, one that you're, you're at the park that you're looking at, um, it needs to be able to be used from 0 to 100 because I'll be sticking around. All right. Swing hey, thank, you. thank you for your message and your enthusiasm. Uh, Councillor Hodgson uh, is leading a task force developing a new playground in our central city. I'm sure he would have taken notes on the message. Uh, I certainly concur with your message of making sure that our playgrounds can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Yeah. Uh, and that our staff will have uh, taken on board some of your broader practical messages about ensuring our swings and so many of the playgrounds that the council maintains are in good shape. Yeah. Unless there's any other questions from colleagues, my intention is to conclude that part of the public forum. Thank you again, Alison. Can I invite Lynn Mays uh, from the New Zealand Packaging Forum uh, before council? I'm sorry, Rob, I didn't realise that we had the benefit of you coming to our little corner of New Zealand as well. Yes, you're lucky enough to get me today. Sorry. Is there a third member? No, just, uh, just, just two of you. Oh, good as well. Look, uh, we're in your good hands and looking forward to your presentation. Uh, so thank you, Your Honour, the Mayor and councillors. Um, today we're here to present a proposal on a soft plastics at curbside recovery solution. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of who we are as a packaging forum, and then Lynn will provide you a summary of what we propose. So I'm the chief executive of the packaging forum, and Lynn Mays beside me is the, our scheme manager for soft plastics. Um, packaging forum is a 100% industry-owned and funded, um, uh, industry-funded organisation focused on end-of-life recovery. So. You, you, many of you will be familiar with us as a soft plastic scheme um, that you see in supermarkets, but we also run a glass packaging forum which funds infrastructure at the back end. We have just implemented a food and beverage carton scheme that's for many people Tetra Pak, which is very, a similar scheme to soft plastics. And as a result of the recent curbside standardizations, we're in the process of implementing a caps and lids program to recover those as you'll be very aware, they're no longer part of that, that curbside. Um, further to that, we um, are also leading for New Zealand the design of a mandatory plastics stewardship scheme for New Zealand. And this is critical in terms of this project because 
When you have a mandatory scheme, it is a responsibility of the parties putting material on the market to fund the recovery of that as best to get ensure you maximise both the volume and ensure the economic cost is, is maintained so it does not affect or limits the impact on consumers. So at this point, I'm going to pass over to Lynn, who's going to uh, put forward the proposal. Thank you. And I'm as passionate about bins as Alison is about swinging, so um, we'll <laughs> take you through this. Um, as Rob said, I manage the soft plastic recycling scheme. We started collections again in Nelson and surrounding regions in August last year. Yes. Um, we've collecting now around one and a half tonnes a month. And all told last year across the country, we collected just over 700 tonnes, which was all processed in New Zealand. This year, we have budgeted to collect around 1,200 tonnes, and that is to meet the demand of the processes that we have in New Zealand. So to do that, we actually need to make it easier for the consumer because um, I'm not sure that you can see on this, but effectively what these slides show is that the best recycling is achieved. If you see the right-hand side there at the top, you've got drinks containers, and 80, 90% of people find it easy to recycle them in their curbside. Right down at the bottom, you've got plastic bags, and people don't find it so easy because they have to go and make an effort. So what we are looking at doing is learning from overseas. Um, so in the UK, they've just released a six-month report on what they're calling the Flex Collect Scheme, which is collecting from seven councils and over 25 households um, in those, those um, council areas um, and collecting soft plastics in bags in the bins at the curbside. I visited the Somerset um, recycling process last July um, when I was over there. And um, the, the key things about that are there's no evidence that you need extra vehicles. It fits in the existing vehicles well. Um, there is evidence that you need a couple of extra pickers on the line to pick the bags off the, off the, the line. Using coloured bags works. And there is over 90% compliance with soft plastics, so we're not getting a lot of contamination in those bags. In Australia, like similarly, they've, um, they are running trials, or they have been running trials with eight councils um, comprising four MRFs. That's 32,000 households. The average weight there, they're getting around 400 grams in a bag, and they get higher if you opt in. So opt in is where you ask your residents if they'd like to be part of the programme rather than just welded out across all of them. So we are finding, we've got, we're not doing this without experience from recyclers and councils overseas who would also be very happy to talk to anyone here if they want to talk directly to people who are on the ground in those areas. What we're recommending for Nelson City Council is that we target initially a 5% households in an opt-in trial, um, bag in a crate. So these are the bags that are used in Australia, these nice yellow ones. We're thinking orange for here for um, to, to be our colours. These are the ones that they use in Somerset, nice blue ones. Um, so literally you just put your bag on the top of your bin, you fill it with your soft plastics, and when it gets to the MRF, it gets picked out and recycled along with the other soft plastic material that we, we are currently collecting. So routes selected, so we run a trial one day a week, let's say Tuesday. The, those that are getting a curbside collection on a Tuesday will get a soft plastics collection. We're looking at six months of a trial, but and, we, and, and the scheme will fund the, the additional resources and any additional costs associated. But we're not intending to pull it out. If it's successful, we intend to carry on investing in it and expanding it. <coughs> So the opportunity really is, it's industry funded. This is, as, as Rob said, part of us planning the design of a mandatory all of plastic stewardship scheme. We need to know how things work. So um, Nelson would be leading New Zealand in trialing this, if you would go ahead with that. Um, we, we reckon that with a thousand households, we'd be adding another ton a month, which would more or less doubling what we're getting currently. But then if you take it beyond that to your, your, your full um, coverage, you know, we, we we'll really will be chipping into the the, the demand that the local um, recycling plant in Blenheim um, has. And I don't know whether if anyone's ever been to the Blenheim site, that's obviously not a post, it's a mini post, but that is um, soft plastics turned into um, the material for a fence post. 
Yep, passing around these yep. two. And just keeping on track, over to you, Rob, for conclude. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so just, just in conclusion, um, what we recognise is that globally, you know, there's been a significant change in the way we approach material end-of-life recovery. And I think the focus is moving away from waste waste to landfill to diversion to recycling. And New Zealand, and because of your geography and location to the plant, Nelson has a unique opportunity to, to lead the way in helping us achieve that. So we are expecting that extended producer responsibility, which essentially in really simple languages means the people putting on the market are going to pay for the the net recovery of that material are, are coming, and this is our chance to make sure we get it right and efficient and can do it at, at speed. Um, and as I say, the design of the mandatory product stewardship scheme for New Zealand is just one of the many schemes that are already up and, and running. You may or may not be aware that TyreWise is one of the first, and that's already up and running. There's also one around e-waste. This is now packaging, and the first part of packaging is the, the plastics other than beverage containers, which we are designing and supporting. So we we strongly support the initiatives for industry to to fund these. Hence, why we're we're offering to fund this trial. And as Lynn said, if it's successful, we're happy to look at how we can ensure that we can expand it as long as long as it meets the, obviously the economic and the um, value proposition for both. The council and your your uh, ratepayers. Thank you for Thank you. your uh, presentation. Um, look, I was hugely excited when the um, packaging uh, council approached me and said they may be interested. No, in just this trial. Here. We like to be called the packaging forum. The packaging, packaging council forum. is a, a, another organisation. That's my, not us. My apologies, Rob, for <laughs> putting me straight. <laughs> Um, and, and I think this is a, a really good opportunity for Nelson to take a lead. And with the plant being in Blenheim, um, I can see there with being the largest urban centre in the top of the south. Uh, would welcome um, any questions or, or comment from councillors. Start with Councillor Sanson and then the Deputy Mayor, then Councillor Skinner. Um, thanks very much, much back through the chair. Um, kia ora, Rob and Lynn, really great presentation and I'm super excited about this. Thanks for coming to us. Um, I understand that you know this would be a um, trial and no cost to Nelson City Council or mm -hmm. um, the residents and rat pals. Is that correct? Like that's correct. Even in terms of um, you know whatever was required to reach out to families for the opt-in, would um, the packaging forum be looking at you know? Uh, well, yes, we'll, we'll recognise um, any of those costs. Obviously, we'll work with your your yeah. team as how to best achieve that. But we we made the commit and commitment to to fund those requirements, both from a comms perspective and from the bags and any sortation requirements. Um, obviously, as we work through the trial and, and the decisions around transport, that can be anything from technically zero to a cost. If it was sitting on top of your um, curbside recycling bin, we know from evidence overseas that it makes no impact because most of that material is already there. We're just containing it. Um, if you ran a separate vehicle for this trial, then we would fund that also. Have you spoken with them? I think you had Enviro in New Zealand. Yes. I'm assuming they pick up our recycling at the Yes. Time. Have you spoken with them? Have yes, I met with them last week um, and we talked through a variety of options, but they're certainly very excited to be to be part of it as well, which is fantastic. Right, yeah, and I'm just a big fan of Future Post as well. Great to have non-leaching you know, leaching mm. in the vineyards. And... Thanks, Councillor Hanson. Um, I am going to give the opportunity, because I think this is quite an important uh, initiative for Nelson, for other councillors to be able to ask questions before I wrap up. So I'm going to take the Deputy Mayor and then Councillor Skinner and any others that wish to contribute. Oh, tēnā uh, Obviously, I don't think any council in the country would uh, would sort of turn or frown upon someone coming and saying, we will solve one of your problems and pay for it, um, which makes me uh, have to ask the question, why Nelson? What, what sort of put us at, at the top of your list in terms of trialling this here? Well, if I'm perfectly honest, um, 
Nick um, started Soft Plastics for me, um, well, with me, um, to, in 2015 when he was in his previous role um, as Minister for the Environment and, and remember launching bins in Auckland back in the day. Um, but more importantly, actually, was that, as Rob said, you're very closely, you're the, the biggest, you know, centre near to Future Post here in the region. And we wanted to actually have um, a really circular um, solution. So, you know, collecting the, the soft plastic from here goes off to Future Post, becomes a post and comes back here into your wineries and, and, and that to us. And the added piece as well is you've got your e-vehicles doing the collections. So the whole system just is a perfect um, opportunity for us. And, you know, we'd be delighted if you would be our trial. Yeah, and, and I think just adding to that is scalability, right? Well, so we're talking about a small segment of, of a thousand. There's the scalability to grow wider within within Nelson Tasman area and get the insights as we grow. Um, taking on, you know, a very large city is is you know, like an Auckland or a Christchurch, it becomes very difficult to ensure that we understand the learnings so we can deliver the right outcomes. Small is beautiful sometimes, Mr. DP. I didn't realise I was throwing a, a soft uh, soft ball for a compliment for dear leader here. Uh, but, um, I like it's, it. It's dear leader. It's, it's trying to uh, incredibly <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Skinner. Cheers. Thank you for that. Um, so I understand fully... Your involvement is a collection of it, not the product or making a product at the end. You're just collecting. No, so our, our well, so it's it's going to be quite similar to the way we run our soft plastics collections at the stores. We organise the collection of them. So in this instance, we'd work with Enviro and Z and the council, you know, to make sure that we can integrate the collections. But we would then, obviously, as we've said, we'd fund any of the additional resources that are required, whether it be picking the picking the bags off the conveyor oh, line. Sorry, sorry, to get straight to you. Sorry, not, like, oh, yeah. uh, sorry perhaps I didn't understand you. You've got Future Post, etc. We don't own Future Post, no. Okay, the name's come up a number of times. Yeah, so we have a we have a very strong relationship with Future Post. They're our key key partner in delivering the end of life processing for soft plastics. Yep. So we recognise. Now, the, the, the three key elements in terms of delivering one of these, and the first is consumer engagement, which is part of what we're talking I'll about just, today. I'll just, I'll just cut, stop trying to keep it short for other people. Yeah. Um, so you've shown me a product there, but I'm a little bit – put put, a, put my mind at ease in my scepticism in the sense that my understanding of soft plastics, different to so long-chain polymers, you can make yeah. strong products of this, which actually each time you're using it, actually yeah. a shorter chain and gets weaker. My – Concern on I might be unfounded here. With the short chain polymers like your soft plastics, mm. you're limited to soft, weaker products. But I see a hard product there. Yeah. Yep. But that is 100% from plastic no, bags. No, it's a combination of Correct. long polymers and short polymers. But so, so this, my, this adds adds significant. How much of the percentage? My my concern is when I've seen various products that claim to be recycled soft plastics. In fact, you're all you're doing is putting in. Virgin plastics or other no, hard no. plastics along or epoxies. All but that's one hundred percent. That's one hundred percent from bags. It's one hundred percent recycled, recovered plastic. It's there is no. So it's a combination of hard plastics and soft plus soft plastics. But it's a all, weaker product than this. But they've been able to manufacture yeah. something which is sturdy. Correct. So they, they've used other <laughs> other plastics, um, Janitorial. janitorials, and the like to one hundred percent like that block of. There is no virgin. No, no virgin in it. No virgin in it at all. Hundred percent recycled from the waste stream. Yep. yep. Thank you. Any further questions, uh, Councillor Robert? Thank you very much for that wonderful um, presentation. And I, I guess my first question should be: um, How do we say yes now and get going? But um, <laughs> a, a, a lot of the feedback. Um, I hear from people, and um, in a, when I'm wearing another hat, I um, get to work in the in a city. Is a lot of people feel that commercial businesses, be it retail or in the construction industry, get given a lot of soft plastics from their suppliers, and um, have simply no choice but to put it in the rubbish bin because they don't get um, recycling. Is there any way that? commercial facilities um, within our CBD could become a part of the trial at some point? Um, the initial part is we, our focus is always post-consumer um, in the first instance because that is the most problematic. 
um, commercial plastics such as building wrap and the like. Um, they do have viable recovery solutions, but it's different to the the pathways that that we use. It really is a function of the industry's approach to that. But our focus is post-consumer. So our initial focus will be post-consumer, but we are open as we develop the EPR because some of that material is absolutely in scope of the mandatory plastic product stewardship scheme that they need to be considered. But for this, it's post-consumer only. But just to the point, we do have, we are a membership-led, so we've got over 200 and odd members who pay into the scheme which funds it all. Um, and our members, many of them are commercial entities, and they also might pay to have a bin service. Um, so we've got actually, as well as the 300 retail stores we've got around the country, we've got about 120 other locations that might be offices, they might be service centres, also retirement villages that have paid to have a bin. So that's an option. Thanks, Councillor Rollo. Councillor Hodgson. Um, I was born in Somerset and spent the first nine years of my life there, and I didn't know we were known for innovation um, <laughs> down there, so that's quite encouraging. Uh, but yeah, thank you, thank you for the presentation. It feels like feels like we're being offered a pretty cool opportunity and a bit of a freebie. Um, I wanted to ask, in terms of the demand for soft plastics um, from the likes of Future Post, is, are they kind of are they are they begging for more to supply their facility? Is there a likely bottleneck in the future? Kind of where is that processing capacity at? We have three processing plants. We're very fortunate compared to Australia that's really struggling with this. Um, we have two future post plants, one in Auckland and one in Blenheim. And we have a company called Safeboard that takes soft plastics and mainly Tetra Pak turns it into insulation board. So, um, the demand that we need, we effectively, as I put up, we actually have to double, more or less double our supply to them over the next year to meet demand. But we are also looking at alternatives. We have been for some time. We're looking at a number of other technologies that we want to bring in because um, there's about 8,000 tonnes of soft plastic in the post-consumer space in what we use, bread bags, frozen food bags and the like. But there's a lot of the other soft plastic out there, as you've, you've mentioned, um, and so we need to actually be able to, our recycling rate currently is probably about 8% of what we've got. We want to double that in the next year, but realistically, we want to get that 8,500 back through the system as well. So we, we do need to look at other opportunities. Any other questions from colleagues? Uh, Councillor Courtney. Thank you, Mayor Nick. And through to Lynn and Rob. Thank you for your presentation today. Very, very interesting. Um, an extension of what's happening at the moment. So my question, I'll try and wrap about two or three into one. Um, the present operation, you don't see it detracting uh, this new fresh initiative, uh, detracting from the system that's already operating, you know, where the public take their, the people take, the community takes their plastics and their bags to a drop-off point, perhaps a supermarket or something of that nature. That's part of the trial, actually, to see what people... We know there's about... You know, our research tells us about 15% of people will make an effort to take stuff back, and a lot of people won't. So what we really want to do is to attract the people that aren't currently using the system. We know people are, you know, people are quite happy if they want to take their soft plastics back to the supermarket. They'll, we think they'll continue to do that. We've seen in the UK, because they've got trials with Tesco and the like, or not trials, they... You know, all the Tesco stores have soft plastic recycling, but they've seen huge uptake in Somerset and other, other places by just putting it in place. And part of it's the trial. You know, we want to learn what will motivate people to do more, to bring more soft plastics back and make it easier for people. Yes, just to follow. Lynn, there is this um, time it takes to collect the plastics. I know a number of people that do it and believe in it strongly, but it does take time. So how are you going to coordinate all the pickups when people will take different amounts of time to collect this the, material? What they've found in, in Australia and the UK is it takes, on average, um, a couple of weeks to fill one of these bags. Um, and that's probably the same because I don't know if you're, if you're recycling at home, that's probably the size of your bin liner, and it probably takes me about a couple of weeks, of, you know, particularly if you've got dog food bags or big things that are going in. So that's part of the trial as well, to see what the frequency is. 
Um, yes, yeah, so we probably think if, if you've got a curbside collection system that's every other week, that's probably ideal because it means every other week you will we'll come around and collect the bags. Just a practical question. So we, we, we pick a 1,000 households in Nelson, we run a trial, we issue them with those bags uh, for them to put it in. Is it the intention that then, so for instance, I've got a drawer and I stuff my bold bread bags and my... Yeah and other frozen good soft plastic bags in a drawer, and when the wife gives me a hard time, make sure I make a trip off to the warehouse or New Wheel mm. to drop it off. You're going to issue me a bag, I put that in there. Do I actually put that inside the current uh, recycling bin, or do I put it on top at my curbside like yesterday morning? What's, what's the practical way that's going to work? So, so the evidence that we've seen from the trials through the UK and um, Australia is they recommend putting it on the top of your recycling bin. Yep. But ultimately, that's actually not that critical. It goes in the truck as part of that natural material. It's compressed. The bags are of the strength that they don't break. Yep. And then they are just sorted off the line uh, when it goes through environmental dead. Yeah, so mm. preferences on top just for visibility, but sorry to be so practical. No, 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 I'm no just all of these things we've just been working through to learn these good books. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, look, can I? Um, I think, sorry, Rachel, clarification. So, you mean you put all your recycling in, then on the top you put the bag and then you close the lid, so it's actually inside mm. and yep. on top because yep. yep. we wouldn't want to have plastic bags flying uh, down mm. the street. <laughs> can I just, uh, and I'm sorry to ask an awkward question. The government has issued national regulations around recycling. Mm. Is putting the plastic bag in this practical way you suggest going to be consistent with the national regulations around recycling, or will I need to be knocking on the Minister for the Environment's door around that? So we asked the question of the Ministry around that specific point because we expected that question. The, the advice we got was that because it's industry funded, it doesn't fall under the Gazette. And that's the key point, right? If you did it, just said, I'm going to do this because. If the council did it, we'd be breaking the government. You'd be breaking the rules. If you but, did it, it's okay. But we're doing it, what so a, it's a private what a, collection. What a I, that's, okay. that's the way we understand it. I mean, obviously, you will need to take some advice around that, and we're happy to do further advice on, on that, but that, that was the message we got before mm. we came here. Thank you very much again for your presentation. And my work around recycling, one of the hardest things post-recycling after you've collected is finding uses for it. I think we do have a great, grand opportunity uh, with the post-manufacturer in Blenheim uh, to do something smart and new here. And on behalf of the council, can I thank the packaging forum uh, for this opportunity? The vibes I'm picking up around the council table is that there is enthusiasm uh, for us participating in the trial. I would pose a little bit of a challenge, Nigel, and that would be I'm into the circular economy. We do use as a council posts, uh, if we're also able, uh, Alec, to talk to our engineering and see whether there is ways of which we could use the products that come out of the recycling. I think that would be a, a good way for us to be supportive and to try and make this happen. Um, when would practically... Um, it'd be possible to be able to organise the beginning of such a trial for the 1,000 households in Nelson. Is it something that can be achievable in 2024? Uh, definitely in 2024. We're looking into June, early July, sort of our feeling is when we could get that together, depending on how the practicalities with your council. Am I to take the view round council table that we are to encourage our officials to work with the packaging forum to get this trial? Is there any concern different to that direction. Again, on behalf of Council, thank you very much for taking the initiative. I'm excited about the potential. It would be good to get a 1,000 working. I'd want us to be also providing through our NELS and our other communications uh, the support to try and uh, make, it, make it work and look forward to further reports from our officials on it. Councillor Sanson. Um, I just, if I may, one comment also about Future Post sure. and what they're using it for. Um, I've been following their journey because I'm always looking for non-treated timber mm -hmm. for um, veg yeah. vegetable beds, and they're now doing uh, vegetable or garden beds. So, you know, permanent, non-treated, you know, I'm sure there would be lots of people out there who um, would be interested in that and potentially something we could use for our own um, beds in the city. Yeah. 
Now, I think they're all helpful comments. I, I appreciate the support and the questions uh, from councillors. And again, really thank the Packaging Forum for taking this initiative. We look forward to working with you and making a success of this new initiative. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much, everyone. We now come to the uh, next item on the agenda, uh, which is the confirmation of minutes. We firstly have the minutes of the 7th of March. Uh, is there any questions that councillors have about those minutes that have been circulated? Would a councillor be prepared to move firstly the adoption of the minutes of the 7th of March? Yes, I'd be Seconder? Thanks, Councillor Brand. All those in favour of the adoption of minutes of 7th of March, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. Uh, are there any concerns with respect to the minutes of the meeting of the 22nd of March? Uh, would Councillor Rollo be prepared to move their adoption? A seconder, Councillor Hodgson. Uh, all those in favour of the adoption of those minutes, please say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Carried. We come to the strategic presentation from the Nelson Centre of Musical Arts and invite Jane James uh, to come and join us uh, and um, and also Alex. And just pull up uh, an additional uh, chair, please. Welcome to Council. Looking forward to your presentation. Appreciate, like all of our key art iconic institutions, the pressures that financially you're facing and uh, looking forward to hearing an update from you. We might not be looking forward to it when we're finished, but anyway, tēnā koutou, katoa, e mihiana, kia koutou. And I'm particularly pleased to see Finn here, who is a wonderful horn player. I'm currently rehearsing the Mozart Horn Concerto with him, trying to keep up with him, and really he is the example of who I'm speaking to today, so I'd love to see you, Finn. So I'd usually begin my address with, it's my pleasure to... But unfortunately today, there's probably not much in my message, which is pleasant, and I make no apologies for that. But as chair, my kaupapa has always been to maintain consistency and transparency with our stakeholders, and today will be no different. Over the years, we've delivered a variety of presentations to you in keeping with our reporting requirements. We've proudly described our growth since reopening in 2018, our commitment to the Robertson Review proposals, our fundraising initiatives, including the establishment of the NCMA Foundation, and our innovative education and performance programming. More broadly, NCMA is frequently cited as Nelson's Tanga, an iconic institution, a jewel in the city's crown, including by people in this room. We have a national and international reputation as a super cool venue in which we in which to perform and learn a unique place where musicians can recuperate and recharge away from the demands of the international touring circuit. To quote a recent Nelson Weekly headline, the NCMA is buzzing, and I could not be more proud of our hardworking board and staff. At the conclusion of the recent Adam Festival, Rolf Yelston, the New Zealand String Quartet cellist, wrote, the NCMA has become a model for all centres in New Zealand for being a cultural hub for the wider community of Nelson. It's brought the community together with its stellar administration of an unprecedented diverse range of activities, galvanising passionate teachers of music and other disciplines in an inviting, spacious venue with brilliantly designed spaces for meetings and rehearsals, as well as a world-class concert hall, perhaps the best of its size in New Zealand acoustically and aesthetically. That, I'm afraid, is the good bit. The reality is that behind the buzz, we are now struggling, really struggling. How much? Well, we're gazing down the barrel of an annual 250,000K deficit, not just for 2024, but going forward as well. This includes the cost of our debt repayments to the council. Our forecasts suggest that this is not going to improve in the foreseeable future, regardless of whether we're in a recession or not. And why the deficit? Well, like everyone else, we've been hit with rising operational costs, higher salaries to support cost of living increases, the aftermath of COVID and weather events, compliance issues, the ever-decreasing pool of funding grants, and the trickle-down effect on our target community, who, like us, are hurting, seriously hurting. And this shortfall first became apparent last year, our first real year of unfettered operations since 2018. We've economised in every way possible, 
fundraise ceaselessly. And all credit to Jess, our newly appointed F&D manager. We clawed our way back through the year. Now, I know there's been much gnashing of teeth and eye rolling about the financial status of the School of Music over the last century or so. But hand on heart, our staff could not be working any harder, nor could the board be governing any more professionally or efficiently. But we are not, not going to push blindly on into an ever worsening financial crisis. This would be both foolhardy and irresponsible. Our fundraising catchphrase last year was help us keep the music playing. This year we've upgraded it to where will the music play? It's sad because if we can't keep our doors open, where will it play? Where will Finn play his horn? Despite extensive and consistent messaging, there seems to be a lingering view that we're just a music school within an iconic venue. But we don't just sell tickets for shows and rent out our teaching rooms. Our board and staff are the physical, administrative and emotional hosts for thousands of students, teachers, performers, festivals, residencies and concert goers. During the Adam, for example, our staff are on call 24 hours a day with no extra pay. And believe me, a lot of the economic benefits to the city engendered by the Adam and like festivals are due in no small part to NCMA and its staff. Or this Dean, our wonderful office administrator and former concierge at the Ritz Palatum. He's the friendly face for countless visitors who tell him their life stories and ply him with cake. We're so much more than a building, but if we can't afford to keep NCMA open, where will the Adam be held? Where will our kids learn music? Where will you get live music on Friday night for free? I'm deeply troubled by this. Well, I guess you're waiting for it. We're gonna ask for more money. Well, actually we're not, because there's no point. And I believe the comment used when we recently submitted um, for debt remission inclusion in the long-term plan was that our request was tone deaf in the financial, current financial climate. Now, it may have been a throwaway line, but that really hurt, because there's one thing musicians aren't, it's tone deaf. Let's be clear, this is not about debt remission, because we're philosophical about that. We agonise over every decision we make and every request we submit to everyone, especially the council. But our staff are tired and the trustees are troubled. And I worry about keeping them all on board. To be honest, I don't think anyone in their right mind would be a trustee on an arts organisation at the present time. It's high risk and exhausting. We don't want platitudes or pats on the back, but we do expect to be valued, not just celebrated as the token icon even the tone deaf one. When we make submissions, we really appreciate them being considered from a factually correct perspective, and we don't want to be the canary in the whakatū coal mine for all arts decisions. Often feels like we are. So what are we going to do? Well, naturally, we have a, a robust crisis management plan, front and foremost, for all of our discussions, but we're also going to bust our guts to be the arts organisation that succeeds despite the seemingly insurmountable challenges we and so many of the arts are facing. But it's scary. We're neither gung-ho nor optimistic about this, but we are realistic, passionate and committed. <coughs> what else can we be? At this stage, I really want to thank the people in this room, both the staff and elected members who have our backs and always have done. I also acknowledge the circumstances I'm describing to you are the same as you're all facing as a council. And we'll do our utmost to deliver to you, for you, and for Whakatū Nelson. And I'd like to finish with a more uplifting quote again from Rolf. The New Zealand String Quartet proudly call NCMA our second home. And after over 30 years of collaboration with the centre, we are of the opinion that NCMA is at its most successful point in its history. We hope that the Nelson community will recognise its service to the region and continue to support this treasured institution generously the benefit of Nelson and of all of New Zealand. Namihiana kia koto, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Kia koe, Alex. Kia ora, Jen. Kia ora, koto. Ko Alex Davidson, toko ingoa, ko Findexo. Uh, I've been working with the, the board and the team, Jan, James, uh, for nearly six years now. And as Jan has mentioned, NCMA is more than a school of music. 
Uh, if you would like to follow my comments, I'll be speaking to uh, the handout, in particular the profit and loss uh, balance sheet for the December 2023 calendar year. As you will see, and hopefully uh, for returning members, uh, this is a consistent message. NCMA has uh, five current pillars of operations and activities uh, that we record and measure. We've recently added in the last two years uh, a sixth pillar uh, for commotion, uh, and we are separately accounting uh, for cash management purposes. Commotion is uh, in its second year. It's an action-packed weekend of music workshops and performance opportunities for youth musicians aged 14 to 21 years. And it's an activity that we are entering into uh, partnership with Emily Sanson and Scott Burnett and the NMIT. We're providing operational and administrative support for that. You will see that um, at a high level, there was a 100K operating loss for the 2023 income year. There are surpluses, however, in most of the pillars, which are funding the central costs, which are largely um, the proportion of HR administration and team costs. As a registered charity, our focus um, for the activity and financial reporting is on expenditure. And in the last few short years, we've seen the costs increase on average of over 25% some costs like insurance, much more than that. So that's taken the operational budget from around 800,000 to $1 million. Um, sorts of numbers um, and increases in costs, I'm sure you as members are also working through uh, with your own deliberations for to tow to you. The revenues aren't increasing proportionally but we have a dedicated and passionate team that are leveraging their time to engage with the challenges. That's included things like fundraising activity outside the box, um, exploring other grant avenues after missing out on key submissions, and adopting things like tiered pay what you can models for education. And we are starting to see some uptake on that where um, uh, members of the NCMA are um, adopting to pay a bit more than what they have done previously. And that's particularly helping um, with one of our um, important demographics, um, which we like to think of our, as our third trimester um, community, um, who actively look forward to their weekly visits to NCMA to take part in orchestras or to um, attend a lunchtime concert. And um, they're really struggling. And so um, their key highlight for the week is becoming unaffordable. And um, we're working very hard to ensure that they stay connected. Turning to the balance sheet, you can see that that 100K operating loss has used uh, what cash buffer um, NCMA had to carry forward from the December 2022 year. That means that we enter uh, 2024 without that buffer. And so cash flow management um, is extremely important. We've bought some time by securing uh, an MBS line of credit. And um, whilst you can see that there is a, a positive in funds amount there, for December 2023, um, that was just a timing aspect um, to deal with um, payroll requirements over the Christmas New Year break. We're pleased to say that there is currently no drawdown balance on that line of credit. We are using it, but we are managing it effectively. Finally, uh, we are actively engaged with other short-term measures, including cash flow management, and you have seen and heard from us about the establishment of a separate long-term foundation trust um, to provide um, for the future. Um, that is moving towards establishment. That is a registered charity. Um, it's an incorporated trust board. 
we uh, have uh, some challenges with um, some of the funds being encumbered, um, but we're working through to manage those, um, transfer them, uh, and get them invested and working towards the purpose that they um, have been established for. Um, current fundraising needs to um, focus on short-term requirements. And as Jan has mentioned, uh, Jess, our funding uh, and development manager, has been uh, reallocated uh, away from the foundation um, to just build and support the current operations. Thank you. Um, in the interest of keeping uh, keeping the remainder of the meeting on on on, on the schedule, I'll keep this very very brief, uh, but not to neglect regular business. Um, just to let you know that at the request of council staff, we have submitted an update to our statement of intent, which is in the second year of a three-year review cycle. Uh, I understand that document will be made available to you following this meeting. We've also tabled a summary of service performance, which you saw on the screen just before, um, for, from 2020 to 2024, illustrating the rapidly growing social investment NCMA makes in our community, together with the success of the work we're doing to raise revenues from both charitable and commercial sources. It's fair to say that the KPIs we've set for 2024 are realistic and achievable rather than aspirational. That's a direct outcome of the current economic climate, uh, where growth and revenue has not kept pace with costs. We cannot deliver more with less and intend reluctantly that we will not grow further in 2024. Um, and look, thank you very much for your time today. I'll hand back to Jan to direct any questions. Okay. Uh, start with uh, Councillor Sanson. Um, thanks, Mia Nick, through the chair. I'm um, Kira, Jan, Alex, and James. Thanks very much. I'm really, um, yeah, I mean, thank you for speaking frankly to us. Um, I've got a question, if I may, probably for you, Alex. But, um, I, obviously, the Jan mentioned in her presentation around around the debt remission. Um, it's been, a, you know, a topic of uh, hot discussion around this council table in the last um, six months, in particular. But I'm curious, would it, if, if, if at some point it was ever back on the table, would it actually make a difference to NCMA or um, is or or not? I mean, it sounds from what you were saying, Jan, and from the numbers, Alex, that it's um you know really difficult kind of operating situation anyway. And I'm really curious as to how much of a difference something like that would make? Would it be, you know, survival or would it actually not make much difference? I'm curious. Sure, Rachel, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, to give you, uh, to put that in context, um, the NCMA currently has around a $30,000 obligation um, in terms of repayments per annum. And so um, uh, that on its own, if we look at that just from an annual perspective, um, doesn't make uh, a difference. However, as a measure um, amongst a suite of um, opportunities, um, it would make a difference to have that uh, obligation remitted. Um, we are exploring uh, all sorts of um, measures to uh, you know, increase funding. Um, one of the key things that we've issues we've got at the moment is that we're not able to um, fund capital replacement uh, at this time. And so um, things like uh, the uh, the endowment trust, which is established to help with um, exactly that, uh, one of the measures that we're looking at is to, you know, to introduce um, a regular annual amount um, to help fund depreciation and capital replacement. That's around $100,000. So it sort of helps to put in context um, the council um, um, obligation. Just a subsequent, if I may. Um, so obviously um, even something like uh, extending the loan repayment um, holiday would be something council could do. Is there anything else that council can do? I'm really curious as to, you know, obviously we don't want you to fail. It's... Mm -hmm hugely important economically and culturally, socially for our community. Is there any other tangible measure 
one of the um, the practical measures that we are uh, working through at the moment is, um, as I mentioned, the establishment of the foundation uh, trust, and to uh, transfer um, the the seed. Um, you know, bequests and, and capital to get that uh, underway from the Nelson School of Music Trust Board to the separate uh, foundation trust. As I mentioned, some of the funds are encumbered at the moment. Um, the reason for that is we've needed to provide security to MBS in respect of the line of credit. Um, we weren't able to uh, offer um, MBS um, a security over the facility um, because the council has a first mortgage in respect of uh, the loan. One of the things that we would like to explore with council is uh, not to uh, release that security um, but to um, subvert it to you know, a second tier um, in order to allow MBS to take a um, you know, first priority over that facility. Um, so that's probably getting a, a little bit of ahead of ourselves, um, but that's something that we are working to um, uh, submit on. Councillor Rainey. Uh, thanks, Mayor Luke. Thanks very much for the presentation um, this morning. Um, I mean, there's some that, that uh, in the community who might say that um, the current scenario regarding the NCMA and its relationship with the City Council um, it's very advantageous to the City Council as opposed to the NCMA in, in regards to the Council doesn't need to own this community facility. Um, the Council funds the NCMA for a range of community outcomes which are clearly defined in, in a joint operation between Council staff and the NCMA to determine what those outcomes might be. Um, I would like to ask you to think of a hypothetical situation and pose a question. You don't have to answer the question today, but if Council was to own the facility, own the whole thing, and the School of Music Trust was to contract back to the city just to provide the range of community outcomes that you provide, how big would that contract be? How much would, how much would that be? How much would you charge Nelson City Council to do that, i.e. the same model as the Trafalgar Centre? We own the building, we fund the depreciation, and we pay a company to deliver outcomes for the community. Now, you don't need to answer now, um, any of you, because I presume that you have, at least you have got the answer in your head, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> but I would be very, uh, this is a genuine question, I would be very interested to know if we started with a clean slate, hypothetically, oh, and, well, and the city were to own it. Happy, happy for you to have a crack at the question. I suspect the answer is crackloads, but I won't lead the witness. I, I couldn't give you an answer in terms of quantifying it, but for the first time ever in our sort of crisis management state, that's something that is one of our um, considerations. And Pete asked me that many years ago, and I said no. We wanted our independence, but certainly of our many options, that's one thing that is on the table. Hypothetically. My question was, uh, do you have any data on both the 800 students that are um, uh, learning music or on the use of the facility as to uh, the proportion that come from Tasman District? Uh, and the follow-up question from that is, is the School of Music considering making a submission to the Tasman District Council long-term plan for a contribution as a regional facility in the same way in which Tasman District contributes to both the museum and the Suter Art Gallery as regional facilities. So do, you, do we have any data on that and are you considering, because um, my view is that you are very much a facility that uh, services the region as well as the 58,000 people living in Nelson City. So be interested in your comment on that. We do have some data on that. I could only answer anecdotally today um, in answer to the question, will we submit to, to Tasman to, uh, to help with our situation, we are building a relationship with them and have done so, have been working on that for some time. Um, and I, I imagine that sometime when, when that relationship has matured to the point that we can ask them, uh, we certainly will. Um, 
Yeah, I'd, I'd prefer not to put a number on. Um, on sure, the, I, th I think it would be valuable for the conversation. We've got a really good relationship. I've got facilities like Sex and Fuel where we split the cost 50-50. Mm -hmm. I think any honest appreciation of the School of Music facility uh, is that I know many students from Richmond, from the Mootery, from Marpur, from Wakefield uh, that benefit from it. Uh, Nelson is happy and we will always be the, the larger funder. Uh, but I think that is a conversation that this council should have with our neighbour and we'd encourage you to, to give us some information to help that conversation and to recognise that you are a regional facility. Any other questions from colleagues? Again, thank you again for your presentation um, this morning. Uh, we appreciate how tough it is, not just for yourselves, uh, but for our other community sporting and other cultural institutions uh, at the moment. And we'll give careful consideration to the points that you've made, including some quite specific suggestions where we might be able to be of help. Thank you again. Um, we'll take um, a five minute break from now till 10.15 for people to grab a coffee. Council will resume at 10.15.
to uh, reconvene. The next item on the agenda is the Mayor's report. Uh, can I apologise to uh, councillors that with the summit being so important, it was not possible for me to pump it out in time to meet the timetable to go in the papers. Uh, and so it should have been distributed to all of you on Tuesday. Uh, it covers, uh, firstly, the sequin centennial um, market uh, commemorations that began last week. And I want to particularly acknowledge uh, Councillor Courtney for his support with Council. I can also commend the staff on the badge that's been produced for councillors and others uh, to recognise uh, the 150th. Uh, the council is taking quite a modest approach to acknowledging the 150th, uh, given the context of the tight financial times. Uh, but I also think there is value in reflecting on that uh, 150 uh, year history. Uh, and uh, I know Councillor Courtney, the task force, have got a number of events over the next 12 months to mark that. My report also covers the City Revitalisation Summit. I particularly want to acknowledge uh, the support that all councillors gave uh, to the event that was held at the Trafalgar Centre. I don't underestimate the scale of the challenge that we have with the latest economic data uh, to turn the situation around. Uh, I am particularly worried uh, about our smaller business sector over the winter months uh, this year, with the economy continuing to tighten. Uh, but I do think the summit provided a really good foundation uh, for us to be able to make some really good decisions for the city. Uh, I noted in my report that I think one of the strengths of the summit uh, was that it was as much community initiated as council initiated uh, with the what if uh, work that was done by makeshift spaces. Uh, and actually, I want to commend the Nelson Mail uh, and staff for the initiative they took last year and enabling a voice for a number of different views that I think helps sow the seed uh, for a very constructive summit. Uh, I am intending, as I've indicated in the report, to maintain the momentum uh, of the summit, uh, to create some additional task forces to then pick up and drive with that. And I will be consulting uh, both with the workshop plan tomorrow as the debrief from the summit over the next month, consulting with council colleagues about a rejig of our task forces to then give us some governance horsepower to be able to deliver on some of the projects and ideas uh, that have been there and just want to give councillors notice that there'll be a bit of discussion over the next month. My ambition would be by the May meeting to have in consultation with councillors uh, come up with some new governance task forces uh, to be able to drive that work forward. My Mayor's report is open for discussion. Councillors will note the report also, um, the standing orders requires I have a relatively small mayoral discretionary fund and through the mayor's report need to advise council of where I've spent those funds. Uh, I had made a decision uh, to allocate a small level of funding to support the uh, makeshift spaces group in the costs of publication of their report, uh, which um, in my view is a really useful document for moving forward. If there are uh, councillors, Skinner. Just, um, I see it's table, we're just trying to locate, it wasn't in the agenda, and I realise I made a note that you'd be tabling it today. Yes. I haven't read it, I do not see it. Uh, where is it? Should have been circulated to all councillors by email on Tuesday. Stephen, are you able to confirm that my report okay, was circulated? You. I thought it was Tuesday morning. Okay, thank you, very good, my fault. Very good, thank you. Tuesday at 12.53, it was not morning, I misled. No, thank you, I was looking out, looking, looking, out, looking out for it, amongst all my fan mail, I missed it, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Like, there, there is no formal resolutions, and I certainly wouldn't do a late report on an item without giving people a heads up. I think uh, but I did want to include the material from the summit, so my apologies to councillors in that regard. Any further concerns? If that being the case, I'll move uh, from the Chair that the uh, Council receives the Mayor's report. Is there a second for that? Thanks, Councillor Sanson. All those in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, say no. Thank you for that. We come to uh, item number eight on the agenda, which is the uh, latest update uh, from Hannah and Andrew, if I could invite them before Council, on our challenge at the uh, Tohinanui uh, contaminated site.
welcome you both. Thank you for the ongoing work uh, that you are doing uh, on this challenging issue. Uh, we look forward to the presentation of your report. Uh, kia ora, Kaito councillors, Mia Nick, and thanks, Mia Nick, for um, for your introduction. And also, personally, I'd like to thank council for um, being prepared to move the agenda around today to support me personally around the bereavement uh, that I need to take this afternoon. Um, so this report is uh, related to the beach sawdust matter and is effectively an update and also a request for additional funding uh, to carry us through to the point where um, where council, with the support of the MFE, can um, remediate the site and return it to a natural state. I'll hand over to Hannah, who uh, Ms. Kerwood, who may wish to speak more about the content of the report. Kia ora. I have no burning wish to speak more about the report, and I will take it as read. So efficient. The Chief Executive is super impressed, and now I'm just going to be a pain and ask two questions. The first of those is, uh, what feedback have you had from the Tahunanui community in respect of the plans and the way we're managing? Is the community comfortable? My second question is, do you have any expectation of being able to recover any of the additional um, 275, 85,000 in the discussions uh, with the uh, Ministry for the Environment. Um, I realise that they are for the planning, design and pre-construction work, uh, uh, but uh, do you have, what, what indication would you give of the level of optimism of any recovery uh, from those? Firstly, in response to the community feedback, um, we attached a report uh, of the feedback and engagement so far to our previous report, and it has on the whole been super positive and supportive. The one exception was the concern from the kite surfing community, which I believe we've allayed as much as possible uh, with the decision made in the last council meeting. Yes. Um, and I know um, Councillor Rollo has had continued positive feedback on the engagement process itself. Uh, in relation to receiving additional funding to uh, the 133,000, we have been informed that the uh, additional funds fall outside the scope of the MFE fund. So recovery, further recovery for this current stage is unlikely from MFE. Thank you. Any other questions from colleagues? Uh, Councillor Rowland. Um, I'm happy to move the report um, and just echo the comments from the staff um, in a quick statement that actually people are more than happy of what's going on down there in Tahuna, apart from one particular man who still believes I put the sawdust there, um, but that's a work in progress. Are you telling me you didn't? <laughs> what was your birthday? Can I be reminded? <laughs> 1997. 1997. Oh, God. Making me and Mel feel old again. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, he says. I'll, I'll second that. I'll yeah, yeah. I'll so, uh, Councillor Rollo is happy to move the full resolutions. I understand Councillor Courtney is happy to second those. Yep. yep. Um, happy to take further questions before I release our officers. Oh, Councillor Paki Paki. Tēnā koe, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, I just had a little question about um, just the replenishment of the sand under 5.3. Um, it's obviously it's subject to to um, impact from from weather events as well, so it could occur more often. Um, from an engineering um, the advice that you you have received, um, how long how long is it expected for this to continue, and what what options have been explored with regard to a temporarily armouring the um, the the material that's being retained. Kia ora. welcome. Kia ora. Um, in relation to armoring the site, we have looked into it um, in August last year. It's quite an expensive uh, solution to sort of armor the front side of the beach. Uh, the sand, sand bun that we've got in there um, is the more cost-effective uh, solution until this medium term and when we could remove the sawdust off site. And yeah, what we're seeing is um, every six to eight weeks is we need to replenish the sand that is getting lost. Uh, 
So I guess the the supplementary question to that is that when assessing that um, those options, looking long term, the option one which we've chosen to just replenish the the bund was considered uh, cheaper in terms of what time frame? Because I'm I'm assuming that there was a sort of a projection of time time that this this um, activity would need to be to be maintained. Uh, thanks, Councillor Paki Paki. Through you, me and Nick, um, uh, we're to start on this. So, so we have been hopeful right throughout this process that we would be able to move quickly in terms of the uh, the engagement with the Ministry for the Environment uh, around the initial uh, assessment and investigation work, which we we largely done. Um, the next important stage is around the application for Ministry for the Environment funding for. Um, for remediation support. Uh, we have a really good working relationship with the Ministry for the Environment uh, staff, and I'm also aware that the Mayor has also engaged with the Minister for the Environment through his office and is still waiting uh, for a response uh, to his letter uh, on that. So um, when do we expect to have this completed by? Council uh, has pretty much made the call that it needs the Ministry for the Environment to support uh, this work being done. I think if it was all in council's hands, we would be doing it. We would be onto it right now. Um, so, but we would hope, um, with quite a bit of confidence, that we will be have completed this work well being before the end of this calendar year. So, would there be opportunity for, when communicating with the ministry, to put forward that uh, that there was a calculation that was that was made by by our team? That we expected that this maintenance, this replenishment, was only going to 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 cost this much. Any any extras on on and above and beyond that um, that extend because of the ministry's uh, lack of response um, and the delays in time frame. Could we? Is there uh, is there an avenue for us to be able to to put that angle to them to say, you know, this is this is why it's costing more. I just need to be certain that this is not an open ended checkbook that we just keep. We keep using uh, the ratepayers' money to be able to to fund the ministry's delay. Uh, through you, Mayor Nick, I think that's a, it's a really good point. Um, we haven't been backward in coming forward in terms of our engagement with uh, with the Ministry for the Environment. We've been very clear that this is costing the ratepayer. The longer this takes for them to make a decision on where they're going, um, they are quite rule based in the way they operate the. Um, uh, contaminated sites remediation fund, um, but that is also why um, we are working at a number of levels. As I said before, the mayor is also um, engaging with the minister themselves on this, um, so that we can get some flexibility from uh, the ministry uh, and the minister in terms of this. So uh, we will continue to apply that pressure. And I think your point about you know this is costing the ratepayer more and more as we go. Um, and also environmentally, potentially more and more as we are um, removing sand and putting it in different places, the quicker they can move, the better. Further to Very happy with your good questions, um, Councillor Paki Paki. Uh, the position that I would prefer, and it's a decision for Council on this, would be that with the remediation costing millions of dollars, that as you rightly point out, every month that we delay, doing the full remediation work is the cost of uh, the temporary protection. Uh, and the trade-off for us is uh, whether we just wish to proceed regardless of MFE support, which would be a very large incurrence of millions of dollars on the cost of the rate power. And so my preferred approach uh, is that we will uh, continue to maintain the temporary works but without either a commitment from the ministry or a, a, a view that they will not adopt their non-retrospective policy. In other words, if they said to us, go ahead with it and we'll treat your application on merit, rather than their strict policy at the moment that they will not pay for any work that's done, unless there's a change in that, uh, then my intention would be for us to continue the maintenance and the temporary facilities until we get a firmer answer from them. Now, we collectively have got to make those trade-offs. Uh, you could make the call 
and to say, actually, we're prepared just to take the hit. Uh, I'm not of that view. I think this is a shared responsibility. That was the purpose of the Contaminated Sites Remediation Fund. And for now, uh, our approach is one of doing the temporary works, engaging as positively as possible with both the ministry and the minister, but not proceeding with the remediation works until we either get a contract for partial funding or a commitment that they would consider the application retrospectively. Uh, that, that, is, that, is, that is my preferred position at the moment. Are there any further questions or comments? Again, can I thank officers for their work uh, on this uh, difficult and challenging issue. Uh, I want to endorse the comments of Councillor Rollo uh, that it's being managed well with the community. Uh, the challenge has not gone away uh, and we look forward to your further reports on it. Uh, the motion has been moved and seconded for the resolutions that we have before us. Uh, is there uh, any council that wishes to debate those resolutions? That being the case, I will put uh, those resolutions one to four on page three of our agenda. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, say no. Uh, that is carried. I'd now invite Andrew and Martin uh, to consider item 13 on page 113 of the agenda, and this is the third of the six monthly reports. The first for the community services area, uh, Andrew. Um, I do want to provide the opportunity for all councillors to ask any questions on this report. I see these six monthly reports is quite an important process between the elected council uh, and our team uh, on these uh, areas. Uh, and look forward, Andrew, to the presentation of the report. Uh, thanks again, Mayor Nick. Um, really pleased to be able to bring you this uh, report, and thank you for your patience in terms of this report being a little bit later than the, uh, the other two, but um, you're perfectly entitled to uh, question why this report is not perfect after um, we had the uh, wisdom from the two previous reports and the responses that you gave uh, to them. So, um, uh, look, I just want to say um, a big thanks to the Community Services Group. It's a group of around 100 staff, um, and indirectly it's also a group of a significant number of volunteers, a significant number of people who work in our community uh, controlled organisations and partner organisations. This is a group that is particularly interconnected uh, across the community in many, many different ways and has contributed to the outcomes that we uh, deliver are contributed to by many, many different people and different organisations uh, across the region. So we provide a diverse range of services and facilities and also we provide very visible services and facilities. We do this through direct and indirect provision of services and facilities. Um, and our team tends to do it with passion, and uh, this tends to be an area that is highly visible for council and really affects council's reputation publicly and really cements the effect that this council has uh, on our wider community. So if I get into the um, into the report itself, um, I'd note uh, in the finances that at the end of the first six months, at the end of December 2023, uh, we were running a higher than planned deficit. Um, and the key areas that explain that deficit are laid out in 0.5.1. Um, in general and explain in more detail uh, further into the financial commentary in the report. Uh, at year end, uh, in terms of OPEX, we expect to run uh, an unfavourable variance of around $750,000 across the group uh, of activities. The reasons for this uh, predicted unfavourable variance in our OPEX are to do with unbudgeted expenditure. Two key items there. One is the matter we've just been talking about, which is the sawdust issue at Tahuna Nui Beach. 
And the second one is the decision that Council took with the Arts Festival to reinsert uh, funding for the Arts Festival in this annual plan, um, which was treated as unbudgeted expenditure at the time. I missed a little bit of my introduction, which was to talk about the scope uh, of ac our activities and throw in that we are in charge of swings. Um, we are the swinger part of the council. <laughs> and um, so it is not our infrastructure manager, um, it is the community service. I always knew you were a swing manager. <laughs> um, uh, and also, we are also in charge of the relationship with uh, the NCMA. So um, up, down, uh, that's swinging, I suppose, isn't it? Up, down. Um, and I was thinking of coming in with a really positive presentation today. And after listening to NCMA, it's a little bit more difficult, but um, I'm sure we will get there. We'll let it slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We'll let it slide. Ah, oh, slide. Yes, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so if I just t talk briefly about the scope, I think most of you know it, but um, you know, if you, if you think about our wider portfolio, we manage playgrounds, we manage our community CCOs, which are those cultural pillars in our community, and, right. and it was really good, that presentation and the response you gave to NCMA, because they are not alone um, in being in a really, really, really difficult uh, financial position. And, uh, and I don't think it's lost on anybody in this room that these are critical pillars uh, to our cultural uh, community here. Uh, and in my view, deserve support. Um, we manage parks and facilities. We're the key player in the provision of Saxton uh, and in the provision of Saxton Field. We have a partner with Tas uh, which is Tasman District Council, but I think it's totally fair to say that Nelson City Council is the key player. Um, we manage campgrounds, um, which you are all fully aware of our challenges and opportunities with campgrounds. We manage events, we provide events, we support events, we enable events, and we facilitate events across the region. Um, we manage libraries uh, and provide library services. Um, we provide the marina, which is probably one of the most exciting opportunities that we have in council at the moment in terms of taking our city and our connections to the, to the sea forward. Um, and we also do a lot of community development work, which is where we are really engaged and um, connected into the community particularly. Um, and we have, where we have a big influence, and sometimes that's unseen because these tend to be groups that don't have a loud voice uh, in our community. Um, and we also work really uh, in an inter interconnected way across council uh, in that we uh, require the services from other teams such as our property team for maintaining, our, maintaining and managing our buildings and our projects team uh, for delivering many of the capital works that we do on the ground as well. So in many ways, community services is a very integrated um, team and council. So um, if I move into the financials around CapEx, uh, at the end of the first six months, there are a number of reasons why we were running a $6.1 million favourable variance, and those key elements are covered in 0.5.17. Um, that's not a white tail. Um, of your uh, of the report, and we're happy to take any questions and discuss them as we go. Really pleasing to say that around performance, our performance measures of all the measures that have been measured to date uh, at the end of the six months, we are, um, well, I suppose we've got a pass mark in terms of all of those different measures. One measure has not been, was not measured at that point in time, but that's just because it is normally measured later. Uh, in the year. So the team is doing really well in terms of meeting council's expectations around its key performance uh, indicators across the community services group. Um, and finally, I would just say you might ask why some items are not included in this report. Uh, so when, when this report was first drafted, it was well over 20 pages long. Um, 
I use my license to reduce it down significantly. So if there are some things that you think should have been covered in this uh, report, um, please do please do say so, but also understand that we're trying to give you quite succinct reports which cover off on what I think are the key elements that are important to inform you of. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I have the team of managers with me and Martin, uh, if anybody has any questions uh, for us. Thanks for the report. I also appreciated your last comment. Uh, these six monthly reports are going to evolve and really keen to get feedback, just both from staff and from councillors, to make sure that they are both as useful as possible for both the governance and the management, and that they will evolve. Uh, so I am intending to enable uh, all councillors to ask questions because it is such a wide uh, brief. Uh, I do stress uh, that these are questions that relate to the six month period as much as is possible without being uh, pedantic. And let's start, I think I saw Councillor Courtney uh, as the first question. Thank you, Mayor Nick, and through to you, Andrew. And thank you for the tremendous job you've done in preparing this uh, report, the six monthly report. It's very thorough and uh, I'm sure we all appreciate it. I do anyway. Um, I'm looking at 5.18 on page 116. I want to understand that better, please, if I can. The year end forecast capital expenditure is 700,000 favourably against budget, which is mainly due to 600,000 from Founders Collection Store. What does that mean? please. Um, thanks for you, Mia Nick. So uh, there was a project, or there is a project in the current year, which was to do seismic work and restoration of the building that contains the founders collection. Um, a decision was made by the senior leadership team to not undertake that work apart from weather tightness and um, health and safety improvements in terms of the mezzanine floor. So we are projecting that we will have a favourable variance at the end of the year, um, having not spent that money. Can I have a follow-up? Yes. Um, that leads me into the collection itself. How secure is the collection if that work isn't done? If we haven't made um, secure, I would suggest to you, possibly. Um, and what's, what state is the collection in at the moment? I know we've been having an, um, an archivist working for five years back, started about five years ago, uh, a very enthusiastic person, a lovely big smile, I remember, on my second visit, We're working her way through a mound of um, uh, collection items. How is that progressing at the moment? Where are we with that? Um, that Thanks, uh, through you, Mayor Nick. So how secure is the building? So the, um, the decision that was made by the senior leadership team was to undertake works that were absolutely necessary to ensure that the building was safe and watertight. The building is secure. Um, it is at 40% uh, new building standards for the type of building that it is. So it's, um, uh, it's not a building that we have to undertake uh, earthquake strengthening on, um, but it is an old building. So the, the approach that was taken by the senior leadership team was to undertake the work that was really required um, and not do the work that was sort of more discretionary, I suppose. In terms of the collection, um, as many councillors will be aware, over many years, council has accepted um, items from members of the community uh, to a collection at Founders and has really not done anything with them uh, over all of those years that it has accepted them. In the last few uh, years, and you'll remember, some of you will remember the issue we had with picric acid uh, at Founders, which is a highly explosive um, uh, chemical that is uh, that was during the war used in bandages and, and medical supplies and that sort of thing. That led to uh, further attention being given to managing uh, that collection. Um, uh, so that work has been proceeding since. Um, and then I may just hand over to the Chief Executive perhaps to speak in terms of a decision that's been taken around that um, around that work. Nigel, 
Uh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, and through the chair, um, look, this was a really difficult conversation that we had at the at senior leadership team um, at the time. We were looking at the start of the LTP process. We were looking at ways that we could save money for the council. And, um, you know, we've got the four and a half thousand lines of budget. And um, one of them that came up was this 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 project. Um, there was the, the, the cost of strengthening the building and there was the cost of two staff that were working through this. And it was going to, I think, take another for five to potentially eight years to, to work, progressively work through this 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 stuff. Now, uh, there, there's no question there is some there's some good stuff in, w within that, but there's some other stuff that, that's, you know, we've been donated our lawnmowers, we've been, you know, quite a lot of other things. And we've obviously got to work through those, uh, but there was a significant cost that was going to, you know, to take to, 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 to to do that, so what we've taken the decision is to to park that to to, to keep that those, those items safe for the time being. I did have just brief discussions with the museum about whether they'd be interested in on take, taking some of that stuff on. That um, we were not going to employ two people full time at ratepayers' expense to go through this these items. Uh, we decided at a cost of living crisis time that was not appropriate, and that we could move those two staff to more appropriate roles within Founders. Founders is an extremely important uh, institution of ours, and we wanted to put those people to what we considered as a senior leadership team to better use. So the, the, the items are, are there, they're secure, um, but we're not taking it forward at this stage to, to determine what the, those few things that we should be pulling out and sort of um, doing more things with. I wonder whether there is, uh, and whether councillors at some stage need to have a bit of uh, discussion uh, around the future of founders, we've got the issue of the name and its purpose, and um, I just wonder whether at some stage we should have a, a bit of a workshop more detailed about the future of that organisation separate to the six monthly report. I think the questions that Councillor Courtney has raised are good ones, uh, but I just wonder whether we that's something we should uh, programme and give some thought to. Uh, Councillor yeah, Brand. If I can just continue and respond to that. Yeah. This is a very serious matter that the Chief Executive has raised and spoken to, and I appreciate it. Andrew too, but it is serious. There is and there's been no council or governance advice, uh, advice on this. I would suggest to you that five years ago there was. I would suggest that because a number of us councillors at the time visited founders and found the um, collection in a, not in a good state, a poor state. In fact, awful. And so it was promptly um, moved to put on a part-time archivist and she, bless her heart, set about trying to make her way through the collection. And this is a, an important collection because so is the founders. Very, very important. It was born out of the community. It, the idea came from the community and it's been helped by the community all the way through volunteers galore. And to, I don't want to smat it treated privily, frivolously, frivolously. I don't. It's very important. We are guardians of that asset, and we've got to fill our role as guardians. And so the collection is very important. If we want to, if we want to attract people to the founders, and we learn at the moment we've got a 26% increase in visitor numbers over and above that budgeted, targeted for 26%, so you don't cut something off at the knees, a job you've started five years ago. You follow it through and you finish it. And you, we're not saying to the museum, we're not saying to, who else? We're not saying to uh, the Souter Art Gallery, oh, we're going to cut your funding because we don't think you, you can put your collection on hold for a while and you can put it into storage and, you know. Just think we're going a bit beyond. I know we are, and I'm deliberately going on because it's very important and we got <laughs> very bad publicity in the media just recently on this very thing. And if we don't counter it, yeah, the, uh, I it think... puts us in a very bad light with the community because these are their assets. Sure. Their assets. What I'm, the, 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 the purpose of these six-monthly reports is the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, and I've given a bit of licence for some comment, and I'm going to let the Chief Executive respond. Uh, but I am taking it seriously, and I, I do think we've had a number of issues around founders uh, that with, fit within Andrew's portfolio that I just think us having a bit of a workshop, thinking through the issues around the naming, what we see as its future, what the challenges are around the collection, is going to be the most constructive way. So I'm not ignoring it. I'm just simply saying I think beyond the six-month report, uh, there's an issue there that we need to have a broader discussion about. 
I think, Councillor Corner, you, you raise a very fair point, um, but I, I would like to respond to the frivolous thing. Uh, we, we've discussed this at length at the senior leadership team uh, over, uh, th at least three times. I uh, took that care decision very carefully. I, I'll take you up on your offer of having, uh, I think we do have, should have a workshop. I think we should have founders. I think we should go and have another look at the collection. I think that would be a really good opportunity for, for, for some input, from governance input into this. Um, look, I, I took that decision as the chief executive with the support of the senior leadership team. Maybe we could have come to the governments, but we can't do that for every every decision I take. Um, so this is one of those balanced things. But um, let's have a workshop out there. I'm going to. I want to wrap. Uh, Councillor Brand is next. Um, but uh, but if just for formulating the discussion, if the comments are specifically around founders, were your points on founders, um, Councillor Brand? Part part of them. Why don't I take you on founders? Take the other comments on founders, and then come back to you on the second on the second issue. Is, okay. Does that work for you? Or would you prefer? As long as you come back to me. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say we're scout, out of time. Scout, scout time. I just think in terms of formulating the discussion, it's better to cut the topics off. Yep. Let's take yourself on founders, then I'm going to take other councillors on founders and then move on to the next issue. Uh, and I, I, I reassure you, the intent is serious and the Chief Executive, I and Andrew, are going to organise a workshop so that we can further the discussion around future of founders. Over to you, Councillor Brown. Okay. Um, well, that's great. I'm glad that we're going to have a workshop. But I do feel that the founders is a bigger than what we've just heard because we do have a 30-year strategy for founders and that has been put on hold. And we did have a lot of involvement previously when we had the committee structure and we did meet with and have constant updates and um, engagement with what was happening at Founders. But I want to come to the report on page 127 in 10.3 where it talks about the partnerships. And I noticed that that's talking about one and then it sort of comes down to the to the second part which will come out in that workshop that we're hopefully having soon. Um, I just want to come back to the criteria for organisations or businesses or people to set up and be because Founders is quite limited in its area and its space and it is run very smartly by a group of volunteers who give their heart and soul as well as the paid staff down there and um, I don't want it to turn into a plumping ground of where we don't know where to put this organisation, we're doing something over here, they can go to Founders because that's not what Founders is actually about. So I just want to highlight what is the criteria for people to um, arrive, stay, lease, participate at Founders? Through the Chair, thank you um, for that question. I don't have the um, strategy document in front of me, so I'll be answering in terms of my recollection and understanding of the strategy at the time. So the strategy was um, approved by Council four or five years ago. Um, it paints some high-level goals, um, which are still very front of mind in terms of the development of founders. It talks about the importance of the visitor attractions, so bringing people on the gate. It talks about partnerships, um, particularly with iwi and local entities. It also covers some other um, issues like telling, the, telling um, Nelson's heritage story. So when we consider this option such as these, um, these opportunities with the professional theatre companies and others, we do align it very actively with that strategy. And the ones that have strong alignment, we have a discussion with in terms of um, making founders more vibrant and more consistent um, with that strategy. We're at the very early stages of this discussion. Um, there's no red flags or any concerns. Um, it does seem to align um, in terms of our strategic approach. Right, thank you. So basically what I'll take from that is that just because an organisation or members of this organisation feel um, a group can go there, it doesn't necessarily mean they fit the criteria and they shouldn't keep persisting if they've been told they don't fit the criteria to be at Founders. If... I don't want to name I don't want to name and shame. I'm trying to keep it generic because it is about everybody having the opportunity, but there are consistent organizations that keep trying to establish themselves at founders, but they don't meet the criteria. And when we're looking at the 30-year strategy and we're looking at what is the purpose of founders and what it brings to the community, um, we really need to be focused on what's going to enhance what you've just shared for the vision, is that correct? 
Um, through you, Mayor Nick, I think the, the response that officers uh, need to provide responsibly to this is that Council has adopted a strategy which sets direction for, count, uh, for staff in terms of how we operate the business. Council can make a decision to uh, change its approach from that strategy through a Council decision, but staff will work to the adopted strategy until such uh, until that occurs. That's the only way that we can operate. We we do not have the ability to be uh, to go outside uh, the strategy and the policy that council has set. Yeah, thanks. And my second question about founders is: previous term we were. Um, I was the deputy chair, and we had a chair, and we were constantly updated about the issue around security at Founders with the fence and with break-ins and with damage and vandalism and stuff. Has that actually been addressed? Um, through the Chair, largely, yes. Um, so there have been significant improvements made at Founders with the installation of CCTV um, and security improvements with fencing and a number of other, of other operational requirements. Um, we have seen a significant decrease in incidents since those improvements have been made. You can never say it's been 100% addressed. There's always some determined rat bags who will um, try and climb a fence, but the incidents have gone down significantly. Cool. Thank you. Questions that colleagues have specifically to founders, and then I want to go back to the other area. Uh, we'll go uh, Councillor Skinner, then Councillor Sanders. Yeah, just uh, um, to me and Nick and CEO Nigel, just in response to, um, I understand the challenges on cutting the heritage, and I saw that. I was like, whoa, that's my direction we're given, but I understand where we're at, but I'm also a little bit further disturbed that we've got our priorities wrong there. We're talking about renaming founders. If, if we've got some issues of costs, et cetera, with looking after our heritage, I think it's a bit nonsensical that we're looking at changing the name of founders. That is not something, I know it's in the reports here, it's being um, potential, but it is not something at the direction of this council or councillors have given on that. Uh, but my view is that just reinforces the importance of us having a bit of a workshop and having a bit of a discussion. I'd, I'd repeat, I'd repeat that we've got our priorities wrong there. I understand the challenges and financial challenges yeah. there, and I echo Councillor Courtney's concerns about the importance of protecting our heritage items. But if we're going to go into a bit of a tangent there of renaming founders as suddenly the priority, no, these things have not come from elected officials. Now, what's happened is that the uh, Whakatū Marae and Iwi have written to me as mayor and said that the name Founders, um, they do not support because it discounts the fact that there were significant human population in this community before the Europeans arrived. I think there's a misunderstanding and Founders is very inclusive. Nelson, so I want to have a debate about the name. Well, I, I just, I just caution <laughs> the priorities that we seem to have today. I know we've got some challenging financial sure. decisions, sure. but well, on one I'm, hand, I'm just... we go ahead with one thing without some sort of consultation, and maybe it's operational, and then when flippantly um, going ahead in another direction, as if it's a priority, I think this needs to be taken I... a bit more carefully and tactfully. Thank yeah, you. I think this discussion is just reinforcing my view that there's a bit of discussion to have there's around a view, founders. There's a view at the table, there's a decision that made the table, and I don't believe that was a decision of this council, nor the past previous council. In fact, the previous council had made quite a different decision. Thank you. All right, I think I had uh, Councillor Sanson, then Councillor Rollo. I, I just want um, to contain the discussion to issues for the sure. founders, and then I want to move yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think probably just in defence of um, council staff, my understanding is we actually have a strategy for founders and considering the name is part of that. I believe that elected members um, have signed off on that strategy. Staff could correct me if that's wrong, but it's definitely come from the governance table, so just... Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's important that we defend that staff are, had only, in that case, only been following governance. Um, I think in the other matter, for me, it's probably just a thing of, um, you know, no surprises when the uh, this news story came out around the um, decision to stop the uh, collection. Um, I was... I mean, I was just like, oh, I don't remember us making that decision. Maybe, you know, there was a lot through the LTP. It would have probably at some point, given that there had been, I think, some governance direction to care for the collection, it would have been helpful just to have had an update that that was no longer happening. 
Just, just on the note surprises, I was equally surprised to see it in the media. And I have had a word with the PSA who, who put the press release out and said, I would prefer that, you know, a really strong relationship with the PSA that, that, that if you're going to put a press release out like that, wouldn't mind a heads up. That would be great. Um, <laughs> and and, and, and uh, Toby, the new um, convener, has, has agreed that that would, be, that would be appropriate. So I was equally surprised to see that headline. And um, yeah. Uh, any other questions on founders? Oh, sorry, Councillor Rolmo. And then a uh, um, follow up point for Councillor Brandon. Thanks, Menick. And um, I was just going to ask, I know late last year we had a, I think there was a news article run on events happening at um, Founders Park and um, concern from neighbours around, you know, the, the more frequent um, events that are taking place there. Are, are we happy at the moment with the amount of events that we're having down at Founders? I note I'll be attending one this weekend. Um, and also, um, have we made any progress on resolving a positive relationship with the neighbours of Founders when these events are taking place? Through the chair, um, we love the events at Founders. We'd be delighted if there were more. Um, as you're aware, um, operating a, um, what can be at times noisy events in a residential neighbourhood does have its challenges. Um, we're planning to submit a variation to the noise consent in coming weeks. Um, yeah. Always, always a pressure to manage. Uh, I just think on the uh, timing of the workshop for uh, the founders, I, I would like that schedule so it can feed into the LTP, because there are decisions that relate. These are all difficult questions around how much you want to spend, how much you want the rates to be, and how much you want to do. And so it'd be good to have that workshop scheduled in time that if councillors want to head in a different direction, that we're doing so quite transparently with that, that cost equation. Uh, so we're going to take that out from there. Moving on to other issues, uh, back to Councillor Barrington. Uh, thank you, Hrithamir. Yeah. My, my next issue is on page 119, 7.2.7, about swimming pools. I know you've just put in a very short little snippet, um, and my question is going to go bigger than that. And um, with Nayland Road, uh, Nayland Pool now closed um, for the winter, I've been getting a lot of feedback about why people won't use Riverside Pool, and one of them relates to the safety of using that facility and also the cost. So I'm just wondering, um, I'm not sure if the numbers are up or down or that's reflected in any of the data that's been collected. And the other part of that question is, would council, and I know we had a Section 17A put out last term about the aquatic facilities, um, would we be looking at bringing that and managing that back in-house um, to help with the maintenance, costs and management. Um, thanks. I'll kick this off, and um, Ms Kirkwood may wish to um, add where I get it wrong or I'm not technically knowledgeable enough. Um, in terms of Section 17 review, that is a key part of the decision-making in terms of how we procure services or provide services around our key facilities. It would be really difficult for us, I think, at this point in time when we're actually already out for procurement on that one to change our mind and say we want to bring services back in-house. So um, uh, we provide you with a Section 17 review, which is provides a robust analysis around the pros and cons of just different decisions. So in terms of the feedback that you've uh, been receiving, I think probably all elected members have been receiving feedback. Uh, our park staff, parks and facility staff have been receiving a number of service requests on this matter, and I have also received a direct email from uh, from the chair of a particular swimming group as well about the same thing, which I did respond to. Um, my comment in response uh, was that we will be doing a review in the coming year around the costs of providing uh, our aquatic facilities um, to users, and that at a very early glance, and this is not scientific at all, um, at a very early glance, I think uh, our lane charges are actually probably in the higher order around the country if we compare with other um, other facilities. But that's just, you know, that's a fact in isolation from a whole lot of other considerations in terms of, you know, if you're hiring a lane, you're actually taking over a whole lot of real estate um, that costs a lot to maintain. So there's a whole lot of deeper analysis that needs to be done around um, uh, what, what our charges should be. But I think... Um, you know, we do need to do a review of what the charges are for our aquatic facilities. 
But, you know, we also need to bear in mind if the charges are lower, the ratepayer pays more. That's just how it is. That's the private public benefit ratio that um, that we need to think about with all of these sorts of decisions. It might be um, useful. We are all aware of the cost pressures. Uh, if there's any up-to-date figures on the usages of Riverside uh, that we could get down the track just to get a feel as to... Um, We've got a large amount of capital side tied up in the facilities, as Councillor Brand correctly points out, and we want to see them being used. And if there was some sharp change uh, in usage, uh, it would be useful to have that. Uh, I, Councillor Brand. Yeah, I just feel that it might get a little bit skewed at the moment because most of the swim clubs have been pushed out to the aquatic centre out at Richmond, which has increased the demand out there. And because of the um, some of the the risk that some of the older generation feel that they are exposed to by using Riverside, um, they feel they need to go to the aquatics in Outland Richmond now that Nayland Pool is closed. Um, so I feel that there's other factors that might need to get weighted into those data collection um, because I've been told quite clearly that um, people will not be using the Riverside pool this winter um, until the Stoke Pool reopens because they don't feel that they are safe and they want to prevent themselves from injury at using the Riverside Pool. So I just feel there could be some skewed information in there and we might need to factor that in with our probabilities um, Okay. on that. Um, the other thing is there were some issues happening. Oh, sorry. Excuse me, Mia, can I please respond to that one? Because uh, yeah, sure. Because I take safety extremely seriously and uh, and our staff have not received, as far as we know, any inquiries about the safety of Riverside Pool. Now, I know that when I first started here, we did a due diligence safety tour for my knowledge around Riverside Pool, and we picked up a number of items. I think Councillor Skinner and Councillor Brand both attended that, picked up a number of items that were remedied at the time. If there are members in our community who do not wish to use that pool because of safety, issues, they need to be raised with our staff. Yeah, and I have advised them to filter that through the long-term plan so that we can factor that into the discussions. Uh, actually, um, if you don't mind me and Nick, I would like that information well before the long-term plan because that's an issue for me. Okay. Great, I'll get them to email you directly. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions um, you want to follow So up? just with the Nayland pool, there had been an incident there, and I have had been asked for an update if the um, issue that I know Mr White is aware of previously, um, have the implementation of the management of the delicate matter, um, has that been fulfilled over this use and has shown more... Trying to get the right words, um, management of, of that situation so it hasn't happened again and the, the steps are fully in place so the, the people concerned um, feel that anyone of any age is able to use the facility. Yeah. I believe I know of the delicate matter you're speaking of. There have been a couple. So I think, um, look, we took, obviously, we took that matter extremely seriously and liaised with the contractors and the police and some of the parties involved. Um, and really robust measures have been put in place and remain in place. It's great to hear. Thank you for that. And that's my parting comment, playgrounds. As Sweet. an older person that uses playgrounds, and I have grandchildren who are six and nine, yes. and that they came to Nelson to use a playground, and they were missing the appropriate equipment, but they love their swings, and you can never get them off them, just as you can with their slides. But they also love the climbing walls, and so eight to 12-year-olds would be very good to be included in the older age group instead of the younger playgrounds. Um, when you're looking at that, and I'm sure my butt can fit in any swing around. I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, any other questions, uh, further new topics on the sixth monthly report? Uh, Councillor Stella, and then I have Councillor Rollo. Thanks, Mia, Nick. So um, three questions. The water tightness or weather tightness issues at Trafalgar Park Pavilion, the age of that building and the mode of construction, is this 
getting in the territory of sort of leaky homes type situation. Yes, potentially, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and just to comment on the um, financials or a question, we've had some unbudgeted expenditure and so on. How will that, do you anticipate that feeding through to the second half of the financial year and will there be some sort of cost overruns carry through and how will they be met? For example, will that be serviced by debt? Or... Um, Ms. Harrison may be able to assist me uh, with this, but, um, but this is the challenge that we have when uh, unexpected uh, activities occur during the financial year that um, that council uh, incurs costs for. So broader across the organisation, there tends to be a, a wash up at the end, but um, I imagine there is the potential for an unfavourable variance across the organisation, but I don't know what the termino terminology would be. Councillor Stella? Yeah, thanks. And finally, just the item on um, alcohol advertising at Saxton. And there is uncertainty about the future games because they're, you know, the policies of NCC via that management plan and New Zealand cricket are inconsistent with each other. So we have a policy of not allowing alcohol advertising and New Zealand cricket has a policy of entering into commercial agreements with alcohol companies that involves advertising at um, sporting events. And quite rightly, we are revisiting our policy. So my question is, to what degree have council staff had conversations with New Zealand Cricket directly about their policy? And have they mentioned any intention to revisit their policy to provide certainty about the future of games at, at Saxton? Um, thanks uh, for the uh, question, question Councillor Stella, through you, me and Nick. Um, we do not have a line to New Zealand Cricket. Our engagement is with Central Districts Cricket. And uh, and that's who we work through. But but I think it's fair to say that our current policy is very very clear. Um, but really, we have we don't know what New Zealand cricket's appetite to change its policy would be. Although I could speculate that it probably doesn't have much of an appetite to change its policy, given that it depends on that revenue. Okay, thanks. And just sort of to follow up, so there has been no discussion from any cricket body around this at looking at their policies to to ensure there is secure, um, certainty about the games going ahead. I just think we need to be clear between I took Andrew's comment to be there's been contact with central districts and Nelson cricket, but not New Zealand cricket. So when you said cricket bodies, I think there's been discussion with the cricket bodies, but not New Zealand cricket. But I'm happy for Andrew to clarify. Uh, thanks, Manic. That's absolutely correct. And um, this is not a matter of Central District's cricket's policy. This is a matter of New Zealand cricket's policy. And New Zealand cricket is not a party that we have been able to engage with on this. Uh, question from Councillor Rollo. Thanks, man, Nick, and if you may indulge me, I only have free for Andrew today, and I'll start by saying um, I was very excited to see the Tahuna Nui Reserve Management Plan mention that it's coming to us soon because it was a whole year ago I was instructed to go on do some pre-consultation feedback in 12 months on we're going to do something about that. But So thank you for that. That's not, not a question on that. But I did want to talk about... Um, 8.21 with the um, open space um, operations and maintenance contract and note that um, earlier last year we had some, um, and probably from the end of 22, there were some real concerns from both our end and the contractor's end on how that contract was currently going. Um, have we seen improvement on that um, or are we still of concern? Andrew. Um, through the chair, we have seen a great deal of improvement in the partnership between NELMAC and NCC, and a large part of that is due to the fact that NELMAC have committed to bolstering their staff offering and, and brought in some management professionals who are really adept at building that partnership. Um, I also must Tātoko Sarah Clark, our team leader of Parks, because she has worked really, really hard on, on building that relationship and, and being the prime council contact for that contract. Um, so while there are still the odd failing, um, 
as soon as as we discuss at our monthly contract meeting, they they try their hardest to remedy. Um, they are obviously under a lot of budgetary constraints and pressure. So yeah, I would say the partnership is is going really well. Oh, thank you. And um, I have two more questions. Um, the next one's on the Adopt a Spot project. And I um, had some feedback recently from a group in the community who are quite keen to get on board, but were taken back by when they approached council on that. They seem to be told that we are not currently taking any new recruits for that project. Um, is that due to current staffing levels or what are we um and if people are getting turned away, are we taking a note to get them on board um, as soon as possible? It is due to lack of staff resource, unfortunately. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, to run a volunteer program like that takes a lot of resource. Um, so we look forward to being able to utilise them at some point in the future. Um, as for as to whether we are keeping a list of volunteers, I would have to check in with my team about that. Councillors yes, will yes, note. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Yeah. Councillors will note that in the draft LTP out for current public consultation is to increase that resource, uh, and that may give us some opportunity to do some do more in that space, subject to what final decisions we make on the adopter spot. Cool. I, I had to ask the question because when someone lets you know that they've rung the council yeah. and they were told no, that um, we can't currently volunteer, um, you hope that we are keeping a list um, of that. Um, and my third and final question um, is probably to um, Andrew. Um, you made a comment in your opening remarks around Sexton Field um, and that Nelson is certainly the key pl uh, player in that joint relationship. Um, do you think we've actually, I, I've got some views on how we're, that relationship around Sexton Field's going um, at the moment. Do you think we can be doing a better job of really calling that a joint facility or is what we've got now um, a joint facility that we are happy with? Uh, you don't have to answer it. Thanks, thanks Councillor Rollo. Um, well, I actually don't think I can uh, really answer such a strategic question um, uh, to the extent that, that you would like. My comment is really around the amount of work that, um, that Nelson City Council staff put into getting decisions made through the Saxon Committee. Like, the majority of reports that go to the Saxon Committee are written by Nelson City Council staff and that sort of thing. In terms of it being a regional facility, it's most definitely a regional facility that service, services Tasman, Nelson, and, you know, to an extent, a national facility that services the rest of the country as well. And I think it does that job quite satisfactorily. I get tremendous feedback about the um, nationwide of how jealous other regions are of Saxton. Uh, and, and my overall view of it, it is a spectacular facility. Uh, and that we do very well to maintain it as a, as a joint. Uh, always keen to learn from members of the Saxon Field Committee where we can improve on that. I'm just going to use my uh, exercise right from the chair to ask a quick question. Uh, Guppy Park, I see that the um, we made provision for funding and upgrade in partnership with uh, Football Club Nelson. Uh, I see in the report that uh, that uh, project has slowed and they are potentially looking at a... Uh, new facility. Is there any relationship between the potential for a all-weather sports field um, and the upgrade of the club facilities? Are the two interconnected or are they likely to remain separate in the event the council decides to adopt the long-term plan and to include the provision of an all-weather uh, uh, turf facility? Uh, such a good question, uh, Mayor Nick, and I think uh, the big question mark at the moment is uh, when you focus on developing a facility such as an all-weather turf, there are a number of locations where that could be done, and there will be a number of different clubs and organisations around our region who would like it done at their place. Yes, and uh, and so the process we need to go through, I think, around that, if it does get through the long-term plan consultation as a project, the first piece of work we need to do is to work out where are we going to get the best bang for buck um, for this significant investment. 
So it's really hard to answer that question. Well, it's impossible to answer that question now, but yeah. I think there is, you know, uh, there is a potential option that it could be associated with Guppy Park. Yeah. Thank you. Other colleagues on the community services report? <laughs> that being, oh, uh, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, thanks to the Mayor. Um, yeah, I was um, I was a little bit worried. Just keep saying um, overspends and whatnot, but um, but later on, um, just seeing the amount of work you guys get through, it's amazing. Um, really appreciate everything you've done. I'm just wondering, just at the very end, so um, workload and staffing, um, and um, given we're been spending too much in budgeting constraints. I was just wondering about um, our capacity for a future delivery and and and, and, and wellness. Um, how is the team going, Andrew? Uh, thanks for the question. It's a really nice question to ask, and um, and I'm sure the team will all appreciate that uh, the council actually cares about the well-being of of the staff. So thank you uh, for that. Look, I think across council. Um, and the chief executive has talked about this a number of times. Council staff under are under a lot of pressure. We're doing a lot of stuff. In some areas, we're doing too much stuff, and uh, and we need to tr try and refine that as much as possible. I don't think there's any relationship between uh, the amount of work we're doing and the uh, um, the budget variance that I talked about in terms of opex uh, at this point in. Uh, at the end of December. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, is that we're basically looking uh, at some projects that were not envisaged uh, at the start of the year. And I, and I mentioned the Sawdust and I mentioned the contribution to uh, the Arts Festivals Trust, both of which I think are really good decisions. But, you know, it's no different to any other part of council where things happen uh, during the year that council needs to be able to respond to. So in terms of the staff, uh, if if I was to be selfish and just talk about the community services group, I think there are some staff in the community services group who are under extreme pressure. And it's my job and SLT's job to make sure that we look after staff as much as possible and help them find ways to reduce that pressure through, you know, lessening work program, getting more efficient and that sort of thing. Thank you. It's my intention to, to wrap up the six-month report on community services there. Could I just pass on three uh, compliments? Um, I came in extremely nervous as Mayor about the redevelopment of the Old Maternal Library uh, and in working with the task force, and I acknowledge the other task force members, the delivery of that project significantly in that six-month period was a class act, and all of the team that have been involved in that uh, deserve the thanks of this council and community. Uh, secondly, uh, the uh, Tohuna Nui uh, difficulty around the contaminated sawdust was a massive issue from left field, and, and I've also been very impressed with the way of which no budget provision, staff just get something completely out of left field and have to manage it, uh, and would want at the governance level to acknowledge uh, your team in that regard. And thirdly, uh, in respect of the um, events team, uh, there was a substantive number of events that were managed during that six-month period, and I have had overwhelmingly, whether it be the Arts Festival or the others, uh, really strong positive feedback, everything from events of which you are partners, carols on the steps, events such as the New Year's Eve, uh, all of which uh, your team should take uh, real pride in. So thank you again for the six-month report. I'm going to move from the chair its adoption. Is there a seconder, please? Uh, thanks, Councillor Skinner. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary, no carried. Uh, again, we're on the hour. We'll take a five-minute break and then we'll resume uh, to consider the Suta Art Gallery Statement of Intent and we'll do so at uh, 11.35. Thank you.
to Steve Green as the chair and Julie Catchpole uh, as the uh, managing director of our Treasured uh, Suter Art Gallery. Uh, look forward to uh, receiving the report uh, and the uh, drafts on the um, statement of intent. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I will take the report as read. Um, this is an opportunity for, for Council to um, obviously look back at the last six months of, of the suitor um, in their half year report, but it's also an opportunity to um, comment on their draft SOI. Um, any comments will be taken on board by the suitor and then uh, applied to their final SOI, which will be adopted by the suitor before the end of um, the financial year. Um, I'm going to hand over to, to Stephen and Julie. Um, they would like to say a few words um, before taking questions. Thank you. Stephen, uh, in your good hands. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I think what we did was look at the longer-term issues facing the suitor first and foremost um, after discussions with council staff. And the, th the, the things that I would like to uh, just identify for the for the council is that by the end of this long-term plan that we're just preparing, uh, the, the SOI, uh, will be 20 years uh, since the building was complete, com completed. So um, we're getting into this territory where we are going to have a building which is going to need more maintenance. Um, and neither the council uh, nor the certain board is uh, at, in a position to be able to fund its depreciation uh, over the last few years. And I say again, uh, this year the council has taken the same position. Um, so I just want to flag that as uh, an issue for the future. We have got one specific aspect of the building that we do need to address earlier. Uh, and there's two ramifications for this. It's the HVAC system, the heating and ventilation system, which of course is a very important part of the suitor's operation um, in terms of uh, collection, care, and uh, and as well as obviously the the ambience uh, for uh, for that. Um, the HVAC system needs some major work, uh, both in terms of its operation, but also because of the um, issues relating to environmental issues. It's using an outdated uh, coolant, uh, which is, uh, in terms of greenhouse gases, is probably at the extreme end of what we should be having. Uh, it's no longer being manufactured. So we are going to have to deal with that probably within the next uh, 18 months to two years. And we have got, we are doing work on that at the moment. Um, in terms of our other costs, which are more, um, I, I suppose, uh, relevant at the moment, uh, like everyone, we're um, experiencing significant cost increases. Um, and just to detail a few, our electricity has gone up uh, $20,000 already um, from the previous uh, contract. We're anticipating another $13,000 extra in audit fees in spite of the work that we've been doing with council to um, manage that process. Uh, increased um, R&M fees of uh, about uh, 17,000 and increased insurance costs um, of about 13,000. So all of these are adding up um, and we've done our best to try and uh, manage our expenses, but um, we do need some more support from, from council. And the only other thing I don't know whether I was meant to say this or Judy was, she just, Judy's just received uh, advice from the Tasman District Council that after 10 years, 10 years, 10 years of asking, they have agreed to index our, their grant to us uh, with cost of living. So that's a good positive thing from the Tasman Council. I mean. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I think just, unless you want to add anything, Judy, we're just, just uh, happy to answer any questions of councillors. Uh, Councillor Courtney. Thank you, Mayor Nick, and thank you for your presentation. Stephen, I'd like to pick up on that very point because um, uh, what has been the <laughs> uh, situation with TDC previously? How would they allocate their, uh, their grant? 
Do you want to talk? Sorry, could you just repeat that last bit? Yeah, sorry, uh, it was TDC. It was just picking up on what Stephen had just said, um, that indexed it to uh, cost, you know, and indexed it. And so I wanted to know what the previous pattern was for setting the grant. Uh, well, the, the, their grant to us was set 10 years ago, and it has remained at the level of, level of 87 uh thousand dollars per annum and there's been no increase whatsoever in that 10 year period so we will go into this next financial year still at that same set pattern um, and then hopefully um, this the words this level of funding will be increased by a factor to reflect inflation each year and we intend to enter a three-year funding agreement so that if that occurs will be a major leap forward for us. We like good news, don't we? We do like good news. Yes, we, we thrive on Councillor it. Councillor Courtney, I'm going to delegate you the job of delivering the bouquet to our good friends next door in Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> Can I now come to Nelson City Council mm. and ask what the arrangement is there? Uh, well, obviously, as a council-controlled organisation, um, we have a funding agreement, uh, which is... Uh, how old that is, Jenny? Do you know well, the it's, basis of it? It's through this, the statement of intent Chief, process, yeah. actually. Um, and that, but that um, understanding covers um, operational costs and uh, a an understanding and a presentation from us as to what our costs are, and and obviously um, consideration by the council. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there has been a an understanding in the past that depreciation would be funded. Um, but as I said, uh, neither the council nor the trust board has been in a position to do that simply because of um, of other, uh, other other problems and other costs, I guess, uh, that they've had to meet. So it's been a, a prioritisation issue. Another one that brought up. <laughs> Through you, um, Mianek, to Stephen. So our form, I, I think part of the problem here is the formula that we're using, and uh, I think TDC's picked up on it. Um, so in respect of NCC, uh, we put an inflation-adjusted amount each year. Is that correct? Uh, for the TDC operational there. grant, yes. So now what's happened is that TDC have come into line and they're doing exactly what we're doing. Yes, with the proposal for a three-year agreement. So we'll yes. have to renegotiate that each three years. Next yeah. three years. Yeah. All right. And our base amount, uh, we we look at that too when we redo the statement of intent. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm going to ask a cheeky supplementary off the back of yours, and I'm hard. Sorry, Martin, this is a hard one for you. <laughs> I note that we've provided the suitor with an 8% increase up to $802,000 for this financial year, a 6% increase, which seems in line for inflation. I note under the statement of intent that that's intended to increase by 2% in each of the subsequent years. Now, I'm forever an optimist, but do I believe that inflation will be down to 2% by this time next year? I hope so. Can I ask the question, if it is not, what is the the process relative to the agreement and the statement of intent? In other words, if inflation doesn't get down to 2%, would that be an issue that we would have to consider as part of our annual plan and if we wish to adjust it to a, a greater degree? Uh, through the chair, um, the uh, 2% is a figure that's been... Um, um, chosen by the suitor, not, not council. So um, it's the, their their decision to put that in for that that period of time. Um, we we adjust obviously annually depending on what uh, CPI is and where we are as a council. So that decision is made annually. The decision with ours and our policy is to adjust it by inflation. It's just that we've got good fiscal conservatives running the suitor who are more optimistic than we are about the capacity for the government to get inflation back down to 2%. Is that fair comment, Steve? Uh, probably. You're... <laughs> hey. Sorry, Councillor Rainey. That's right. Thank, thank you, Mina. Um, uh, just, to, um, just remind us all once again, who owns the buildings? Uh, the council. And the council do. Everybody aware of that? <laughs> 
<laughs> not not true, um, Ms. Harrison. Okay. <laughs> Through the chair, we, do, we don't own the building. So this, as I remember the suitor, we made a contribution to oh, the building. Oh, so the, the, the suitor art gallery, as I understand it, and uh, there's more brains at the top table there than what there is here, yeah. is my understanding is that um, it is governed by a specific Act of Parliament. The Act of Parliament provides for a trust. The trust owns the building, but they are a CCO. Have I got that correct? Yes. Yep. That's correct. So it's a bit more subtle, Pete. They are an independent trust. They are a, a, they are owned by their trust, but because of the nature of the trust, they are a CCO. So the asset that is represented by the buildings, I'm not talking about the collection, the asset that's represented by the buildings sits on whose balance? Box? The trust. Is that correct? The trust. Oh, so yes. when we add up and our annual report says we've got $2.4 billion worth of assets, that does not include the physical assets of the Suter Art Gallery, but rest it in the name of the trust? Uh, at the parent level, no, and at the group level, yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, very technical. <laughs> I'm pleased you have to answer that, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wouldn't mind knowing what that means. Yes. No, no, I'm... I'm uh, are these, these are important questions and understanding. So, so, so can, I, can I ask the question more crisply? When we talk about, and I see at the uh, 31st of 30th of June this year, at the end of the financial year, we've got $2.4 billion worth of assets. Does that $2.4 billion of assets include the buildings of the Suter Art Gallery, which I assume have got a value of $2.25 million or something? Uh, so through this year, no, I think we've been just looking at the parent value. Um, because the Suter is 100% a CCO, uh, we do actually consolidate it within our group asset oh. number. But the number that we're talking about, the 2.4, is just the council's assets. So it, the Suter numbers are on top of that. Okay. As well as, you know, Nelmac and other 100% owned CCOs. Right. I thank you for that. I completely don't understand now, so that's... <laughs> No, no, I don't appreciate you. You were confused and now you're completely confused. But, so all I wanted to try and, and, and say was, you know, the issue of, of depreciation is a really interesting one. For instance, um, the HVAC that you, the issue with the HVAC that you uh, mentioned, I'm presuming the HVAC was commissioned when the building was open, which is what, about 11, how I mean, old is it now? The new HVAC, well, the HVAC um, system. Uh, two, 2015-16. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's... Um, Right. Oh, maths, eight years old. Mm. But, um, and I presume at the time of the of the um, construction of the building that the HVAC was a relatively significant proportion of the cost of the construction of the building. And I'm presuming from what your comments were that um, the comments regarding the, there's an issue with the HVAC yes. lies beyond what would normally be taken into account if you were going to depreciate the HVAC over eight years. It's in a bigger... It sounds to me like there's an issue here which is, is, is considerable. Uh, yes, we, we are looking at um, minimising any additional costs, obviously. Yeah. Um, the, the real problem is that the coolant system that's used cannot be used in the future. Uh, now, we may um, be able to manage the system for a year or two, but then we're going to have to make some alterations to it, which could... Um, it could involve $100,000, $150,000. That sort of number, I think, is what we're looking at. Uh, but we don't have a handle on that totally yet. Appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Stella. Thanks, Mendek. Thanks for um, being here today. Just around the depreciation, which is an eye-watering amount, around 450000 a year. Yeah. If I understand your rules correctly, it's 2% on 50 years for assets. Does that mean the collection is itself, in addition to property and so on, is being depreciated? You get the 20 million, I assume it's 20 million at 2%. It's no, no. no, the collection is um, not an asset in the in this accounting sense, if you like. So, And the collection doesn't depreciate unless something got broken or whatever, yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't depreciate, generally actually appreciate, if you like, and then that, that costs us more insurance. Yeah. So, yeah. so the system is that we have to revalue um, 
the collection from time to time. And as Julie said, it generally appreciates because of the increased value of artworks, generally. Mm. Not, not always, but generally. Okay, thanks. I, I was just struggling to find a large enough capital figure to match to the depression, but that's fine. I wonder if you could just talk briefly about the fact there'll be no lease over the theatre for 2025 full year. I think I saw that. What does that mean? Like, how do you usually generate income from the theatre and, and what would that mean going forward? Uh, okay. So the the theatre is has been leased to the, to the state um, cinema um, and they have used it uh, on an ongoing basis. We then have access to the theatre, obviously, when they are outside of their lease pre, uh, provisions. Now, they have curtailed that lease, um, and what we are now uh, focusing on is how to find other uses of the theatre to try and maintain our income. The, the cost of the lease loss is about 16000 I think. It's going to cost us of that order. Um, and, I mean, that's a commercial decision that the state have made, and uh, they were able to make it. The, the lease was at that point of expiry, so they were able to, uh, to do that. Uh, for us, it means both loss of income, but also loss of people coming into the facility, which is, is a bad thing for us as well. Okay, so just to follow up on that, if I may. So over the coming 12 months or so, how many events might be held in the theatre during that time, in a really rough sense, is it just a few a week now, or is it ten a week? Or um, since COVID, it, it's been a lot less than it was pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, we could be having three different events in the theatre in a day. Sometimes, you know, between two lots of films and some other a church group. Uh, we're starting to build back some of the business, but it might be one. One thing a, uh, a week or two things a week. Okay, and just finally, estimated cash operating surplus for 2024 year of about a quarter of a million dollars. Is that like a bottom line figure? That, does that show that everything's going fine? Um, a surplus of... Surplus? What surplus? Am I reading the wrong agenda? No, I think <laughs> it's probably a deficit, okay. I think we're talking about. And that oh, reflects oh. the um, depreciation cost as well. Oh, oh, sorry, the half year. Half year, I think. Uh, yeah, well, that's a deficit. As well. But, it, but the, the bulk of the deficit is in the depreciation, unfunded depreciation. And the other the other part of the de deficit, which is about 40000 more than we had budgeted for, um, reflects those things that I was talking about in terms of audit fees, electricity, and um, insurance costs. So, so we've got a we've got a deficit uh, this year, over and above our depreciation, that we're really trying to grapple with um, in a, at this stage. Yeah. Okay, and just finally, so given that information, there's a deficit of about a quarter of a million dollars. So based on sort of the report in front of us, and that deficit is the suitor in a financially sustainable position at the moment. For? Well, it's. On a cash flow basis, we're, we're sustainable because we have we have some um, uh, some reserves that we can use, but uh, long term it's not sustainable, and that's what the board is really grappling with at, at the moment, trying to see how we can reduce costs or increase revenue, and uh, and we're addressing both of those. Uh, revenue essentially is either through through the lease arrangements or through. Um, increased sponsorship grants, that sort of thing. Any other questions from colleagues? Uh, Councillor Rani. Just a subsequent kind of question, real, um, in regards to the theatre. Has the board ever given any consideration to, um, to sell in the theatre, either to the city or to anybody else? I, um, although we may own the asset, I'm not sure that we can actually um, divest it. <laughs> oh, really? Why uh, we, not? <laughs> we, we, we have looked at coming to arrangements with other um, potential partners to yep. use the theatre more effectively, and we have been in negotiations um, about that. We haven't, we haven't uh, 
uh, I've, it'd be fair to say that they are not um, progressing as well as we would have hoped. No. Um, Am I too cryptic? Uh, no, no, well, I mean, it, it's an interesting point because it was clearly identified in the generation of our art strategy that there was need in the city for yeah. a black box theatre. Now, I'm not absolutely certain, you know, although I could probably have quite a lot of ideas what a black box theatre actually is, but of any performing space in the city, that theatre would be pretty much close to what a black box theatre was. Now, I just think that that is an avenue of consideration that is one that potentially should be open for for a little bit more energy. Um, uh, we, we're very willing to talk about that. In fact, we have had a, a, some preliminary discussions with, with Council about that as well. Right. Um, I, I'm not sure what sort of work would be required. You know, I don't, I don't really know what a black box theatre yeah. would okay. look like either. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think the two issues that you have flagged for us today, one is with respect to the challenge you have with your outdated uh, air conditioning systems, is one that we need to have further discussion on. I also pick up on Councillor Rainey's point. If I have an ambition around our facilities, is making sure they're utilised as much as possible. Mm. I don't mind whether it's the Saxon facilities or our art facilities. Uh, the fact that the state seminar has walked away from your theatre, it is a substantive community asset. I think it is worthwhile us having a discussion around uh, how can we work together uh, to make sure an asset of that sort has a greater level of utilisation in a way that's financially helpful to the suitor. Uh, but from my point of view, we often in our city underestimate the value of the capital not being utilised as well as it can for community events. And so I think they are uh, very supportive of the, of the work you're doing. Good for you to highlight but they, I think, are two particular questions that are moving forward on the statement of intent and on your report are uh, things for us to give further thought to with staff. Thank you again for your report. Thank I'm you. going to move from the Chair, Resolutions 1, 2 and 3. Will the Deputy help me and second that? Uh, thank you. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary, no, Carrie. Thank you again for your, your work, your positivity in, uh, in, in challenging times and looking forward to having the further discussions, particularly around those two points. We now on the agenda um, come to item nine uh, on page 40 and the review of the Joyce Waste Management and Minimisation Plan. Uh, thank you, through me, Nick. I'll, um, Karen Lee here is the author of the report and is involved with the working party and I'll hand over to her. Thank you. Kia ora um, First of all, may I assume the report has been read? Yes. Um, in that case, uh, through the chair, I hand over to you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, speak if the report has been read, I assume there's no brief summary required. So, um, Correct. Should we move? I'm very happy to answer questions. Okay, open for questions on the review. Uh, Councillor Sanson has indicated a willingness to move, but I don't want to cut off discussion. You're happy to second? Or... Oh, no, no, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry Councillor Skinner. I just need to scan. I know it's difficult on Putton's corner here. I think uh, I see that in um, implementing a new plan or retracting the old plan. What's what's triggered that? I mean, a lot of good work has been done in that previous plan, and the strategy is pretty much similar, I would like to think. But you've retracted. What was the word used? Re um, so the terminology um, through um, the Act is revoke and replace. Yep. And in this case, um, what we are asking is to commence the process of revoking and replacing because the current plan would remain in effect. Um, in terms of why we, uh, through the Working Party, um, have made this um, recommendation, this is the third time we are reviewing the plan. Um, the last time it was amended rather than replaced. Great. Um, there are quite a few factors that were taken into consideration um, and the Working Party Chair may perhaps wish to speak to this as well. Um, but primarily um, we are thinking about future-proofing the plan. Um, there have been changes to uh, national climate change legislation. Um, there are opportunities to extend partnership with EWI. Um, there is new legislation both implemented and expected. 
Um, and there is an opportunity really just to take a, a clean slate approach to this plan. And just to follow on that, as you're revoking was the word, it seemed to me quite drastic, a big change, which is removing it, and, and, and there's a bit of a risk there, but you feel that the old plan just doesn't fulfil with, with amendments. My, my, what I'm probably leading to is that um, as a task force have come up with this, and I, I appreciate today we've got it in front of us, but I feel like it hasn't been a sort of council input. Through the chair. The, um, there have been extensive discussions with the working party. We had our first meeting uh, on the 8th of February where we presented um, our options, which included to um, commence revoking and replacing or to amend or to retain the existing plan. Um, and the uh, reasons we put forward uh, for proposing a new plan, given that the amount of work involved in amending the plan is not that dissimilar to the amount of work involved in replacing the plan. It felt it was a good opportunity to do this. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question I had, and look, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, Councillor Stellard, for you to make a uh, contribution as the chair, uh, is in rewriting the plan, uh, the alignment with what central government is doing is going to be a part of that. A number of the strategies relate to the previous government and there may be changes of policy. How do you see the timing of the rewrite of the new plan working within what you know from the Ministry for the Environment of any changes around waste levy, some of the prohibitions and some of the other policies that have flowed from central government? In terms of um, reviewing and replacing the plan, we're working uh, within a timeline of six years um, from the adoption of the previous plan. So that, to a certain extent, um, uh, manages um, the timeline we're working within. Yep. Um, we're taking uh, Te Rotaki Power, the new New Zealand waste strategy, as our basis, but we are quite aware that there is still a range of legislation that has a question mark over it. So part of our challenge is to create a plan which supports intention and, and allows us to future-proof for potential legislation changes. And we are keeping in touch with MFE um, and with all the relevant parties to ensure that we are as well informed as possible about this. Have you had any signals from MFE of any changes or significant changes in policy those from those that are outlined in the report? Not so far, no. Thank you. Aaron, did you, sorry, Councillor Stella, did you want to add any comments to the recommendations? Um, yeah, thanks, Mayor Nick. Um, so myself and Councillors um, Sanson and Benj uh, on the Working Party that's handling this piece of work around um, revising the Joint Waste Man Management and Minimisation Plan. Um, so that's all dictated under central government legislation that we must have that plan and we must res revisit it every six years and make a decision whether to just keep the existing plan or make modifications or start again from scratch. Um, so at our previous meetings, we have that power to recommend to council and so that's the recommendation we're bringing today. Um, it's important to keep in mind, I think, the whole funding arrangement around this work, which has been touched on by Nick, and that when we take waste to landfill, there are two levies, a waste um, disposal levy, which goes to central government, half comes back to council, half goes into a contestable fund for anyone, um, and there's a, a local disposal levy. Those levies can only be used for waste minimisation projects and only those projects that are in this plan. So it's really care um, important that we give careful thought to that. Um, this is a really dynamic area of work that ties in with greenhouse gas emissions, energy generation, shift to a circular economy, landfill management, and so on and so on. And a lot has happened in the past six years since the existing plan was first developed. And, and when we look at some of the plans that other councils have put out in the last year or two, they're really quite different to the plan that, that we have. Um, and we have this partnership agreement between the councils and EV and so on. So there's all these really good reasons, I think, to completely look at this plan again and make it fit for purpose and, and future proof um, and so on. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would say at this stage. And I think TDC have already had this proposal before them and have supported it. So it's got to go ahead from them. And now, and I just encourage people to think of opportunities. There's 
in revisiting this plan and engaging with stakeholders and so on, there's great opportunity to make gains in that whole waste mineralization and energy and environmental health you know, field. And um, I really look forward to doing this work. Thank you for your work as the chair. Really appreciate the overview. I'm going to ask just a slightly important question for you. You know, when you said that there were other councils that have developed new plans, would you say that we are behind the pace in the state of our current plan and that's one of the drivers for this new? Yes, I, I'd say we're not behind the pace. Is one way of putting it. We're not being um, sort of adopting new technologies or not being ambitious enough and not aligning with um, legislation and councils. So, yes, in summary. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Thank you, Vic. And to the officers, um, with this change of or evoking a new plan and a new requirements, is that going to add costs for Joe Public? Um, through the chair. No, we already have budgeted the cost of reviewing the plan and this recommendation has no implications in terms of the cost of the process. Well, I mean, not, not so much in the putting together the plan, but in the end of the day, when it comes to waste management, are they going to be, it's going to trigger some more costs in regards to uh, putting money towards greenhouse gases or circular economy or, or, or carbon requirements or not non-requirements? So, through the chair, the role of the WMMP um, is that high-level strategic guidance that gives direction. Um, the um, application has to go through um, activity management plans and long-term plan where decisions are made. Um, the direction that we give um, can be interpreted by council as they choose appropriate. So, under the new plan, if it's adopted by both councils, costs to the end user will be the same as if we'd status quo and keep the same the old plan? My response would be that that would be um, through the long-term plan process. So I'm not that suggesting that there could be costs or not costs? Or maybe um, yeah. so, so through you, me and Nick, yeah. So, so the current joint waste minimisation plan, for example, sets a, um, a, um, a criteria that we have to reduce our, our waste by of 10% of per capita per year, for yes. example. Yeah. So if I use that as an example, the, the new plan could well change that. And that will obviously need to come um, to the to this council. And um, what Karen's saying is that we actually can't preempt what a full review of this because what, what the outcome of that will be, because this will go through a consultation period. It will then come to the working group. It will then come to the two councils to sign off. And how council gives effect to that will be as part of the as part of the AMPs. And that will be through a future uh, um, annual plan or potentially through the, uh, the long-term plan. But whether this is a review or a rewrite, we still face the challenges of what uh, any new joint waste minimization could be. We just don't know at this, at this moment in time. But that, that, that's a, it, it, it could be. It could be less cost. It could be more cost. It could be greater emphasis on, on, on what each council needs to do. Absolutely. I think that explanation is helpful, but I also think uh, Councillor Skinner's questions about where do we get that opportunity to make those trade-offs around those costs? And I think you've given us a good direction as to we're really just marking the beginning of the process. Uh, and I think you can take from Councillor Skinner's questions, and I will have similar questions, is always looking for that value for money in the process. Are there other questions? Councillor Stella, would you be happy to move the five recommendations? Yes, I would. And Councillor Sanson would be happy to second? Thank you to both our officers. Uh, that is now open for debate. Uh, Councillor O'Neill Stevens. Thank uh, you. Deputy Mayor O'Neill Stevens. I, I'm technically both. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I confess I like a deep nerdiness when it comes to waste and waste mineralization and even like the language of referring to it as waste when so often we're talking about really crucial resources that can and should be reused. Um, I just want to really acknowledge the work um, of the working group members. Uh, this is a like a really crucial area and it's often where it ends up at a council level of discussion is when we're signing our fees and charges uh, during our annual plan and our long-term plan, and we go, oh, it's getting really expensive um, for the, in terms of the levies uh, and the cost to um, dispose of waste at landfill. Uh, truth is that cost is not going to be coming down uh, in the near future, if ever. 
uh, disposing at landfill is an expensive thing to do, um, and it has expensive consequences for us locally and nationally and internationally. Um, and so what's really key here is actually providing the opportunity to reduce how much we are putting through the landfill. Um, if we want to make things more affordable, minimization is one of the best things we can do because there is less we have to pay to get rid of. Um, and so when we talk about affordability, that is a really key element of this. Aaron touched on you know, all of the key things around looking at this through a climate change lens, through an energy lens and energy conservation in terms of how much potential energy we throw away in the form of waste instead of designing at the outset for that energy to be reused through uh, products that are seen with stewardship from their, their creation to their end of life. Um, you know, fundamentally, we need a major shift in how we think about this process. As a country, we are well behind um, uh, the eight rule here. And locally, uh, we're seeing other councils get ahead of where we are. So I'm really excited. We've got a great team um, in this space and I'm really excited about what can come here. I guess my final push would be that actually central government needs to lift its game in this space. Um, we need nationally consistent frameworks. Some of that work was started, but we haven't seen it go far enough. And if we want to address what is a really key issue for our community, whether people realise it or not, um, we actually need some leadership at a national level as well. And there's a lot more work to be done here. Um, but we can do our part locally. And I think Public Forum highlighted um, another opportunity for some of that local work. And so look forward to seeing what comes back. Any further contributions to the Deputy Mayor? Just make a brief contribution myself. Uh, concur with much of what the Deputy Mayor has said, uh, but we also need to be very mindful that we are in a real pressure of cost of living pressures and we're all feeling the pressure of inflation. You may think waste is completely separate from that, but in every contractor, and yesterday when I was with colleagues uh, visiting some construction sites and talking to builders and saying, why have your costs gone up so much? They specifically cited one of the issues being our landfill levies. Uh, equally so when it comes to consumers and businesses. They are paying these levies. They have gone up very dramatically over the last five years, and we can't in one breath say we're really worried about inflation and cost of living, and then on the other hand drive up costs that actually do impact on sort of every element. That's not to say we shouldn't do it. It just means that we should have a, a cost of living lens and a value for money over everything that councillors are doing, including in the uh, in the waste area. Uh, and so, yep, really keen for us to do some smart stuff. think there's a really good case uh, for the joint working party to get up on a, and update our waste management plan, uh, but also an invitation who's working on that team to be mindful that every cost that we put on there, whether it be a waste levy or our charges at the landfill, do end up being paid for by the consumer, and the consumer is under cost pressure and that actually impacts on our own cost structure uh, as a council. And that's not to say we shouldn't do it. That just simply says that we need to give everything a, a good value for money test. Councillor Stella. Oh, assuming there's no more debate, I will... Yes, I should write a reply. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, so some good points there. And I thank the Deputy Mayor for raising the point of the word waste. It only becomes waste once we actually waste it. Uh, you throw it away or do something senseless with it. At every step until that point, it does contain energy or nutrients or something as a resource. Um, just to touch on this issue of costs, in, in this field and many others, over time, when, when costs go up and down, if we're reducing costs, generally that means we're externalising them and we're, the cost is borne by the environment rather than our back pocket. And, and that's actually not a solution because that cost is still there and it will be up to us to solve it in the future rather than today. So I, I'm a, I think if... If we have an appropriate cost structure, it does give incentive to innovate, to change, and hopefully it will mean we're taking responsibility for problems of our own creation today and not in the future when they're even greater. And, you know, anecdotally, I've also heard from contractors who have said, you know, in the past the costs have been so long for low for landfill, generally the decisions made throw it to landfill, throw it to landfill. It's just too easy rather than consider reuse and repurposing and so on. So it's quite appropriate to talk about that and find the right point at which 
it is still affordable and doesn't hit the community too much, but it incentivizes the right kind of behavior and incentivizes us to think carefully before we actually make it waste. Uh, thank uh, Councillor Stallard for his contribution and for the work uh, that you're doing collectively for us uh, with Tasman on this piece of work. I'm going to put those resolutions one to five. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. Aye. Can I have that recorded in the minutes? Uh, yes. Happy to, to have that recorded. Is it normal to have it recorded or do I have to have a division for it? Uh, uh, Oops, that's right. Sorry, I'm getting a wee bit sloppy. A number of times, Mr Chair, you've asked if we wanted to record it when there's been a vote. You said, do you want to record? And I said, yay or nay. Yeah, good as going. Uh, so yeah, that shall we, so shall we record it? Vision. Can I invite um, Richard, uh, Mandy and team uh, to deal with our next paper on the cat bindle? Um, and can, can I just thank the team? Uh, we asked for work on this to be progressed, and um, I'm... Uh, delighted with the the progress uh, that has been made, and that this paper ended up on our on our agenda. So, we welcome you speaking to the report. Um, I'm particularly pleased at the way in which we've got a really good relationship with Tasman, see real benefits from us uh, working in tandem with them. And so, uh, introducing your report. Thank you for bringing it to us. Uh, Marina, Mayor Nick, and councillors, thank you very much for your for your comment. Um, as a brief overview, this is really uh, bringing back to the council following the workshop that we had in June last year, looking at a whole range of cat management issues. Um, we have progressed uh, consideration of dealing with the feral and stray cat issue through the changes to our pest management plan um, and uh, submissions of that just closed off recently. Uh, and so what this report is, is doing is... Um, progressing or getting a direction from the council on um, provisions for uh, addressing companion cat issues um, and just basically to start a, a bylaw approach uh, and in line with Tasman District Council and I've given some details there of, of where they're at with their, with their bylaw. Um, I would just note a few corrections in the report. On uh, paragraph 4.4, uh, the date for the TDC's workshop is the 21st of May, not the 31st. And, of course, you may have picked up on uh, options in 6.1, option 2, uh, the word bylaw should be in there, commence cat bylaw process, not commence cat process. Um, so, yes, uh, thank you. I'll uh, open for questions. Uh, open have. up for questions, starting with uh, Councillor Sanson and then Councillor um, Brain. Um, thanks, Mayor Nick, through the Chair. Um, kia ora, team. Thanks very much for this. Um, really great to see it in our agenda pack. Um, I've just got a couple of questions, um, and I, yeah, I'll start with those. Um, so you gave some really great information about um, the alignment with TDC in terms of timing. Um, I'm just wondering if you've got any update. And, and you also gave information about the pre-engagement that TDC had had with the community. And I noted in there that there was very high support for desexing and microchipping um, and registration in the Animal Companion Register. Um, I just wonder if you have an update from TDC on what they're planning to put into their bylaw and are they planning to include desexing and microchipping and uh, registration in the companion animal register? Uh, yes, I can provide that update. Initially, um, TDC were looking at uh, compulsory microchipping and registration of the microchip uh, option only after their engagement um, they picked up on there's quite a high level of support for desexing as well um, however that still has to be worked through and I think that's what the subject of the, the workshop on the 21st of May is going to be uh, is to determine the extent uh, and detail of the bylaw um, thanks for that um, sorry just to yeah. um, clarify through the chair um, that'll be the draft bylaw before that yes. goes out yep. of consultation. Yep. I mean, all of this is draft. Yeah, it? Yep. it doesn't become a bylaw till it's been out and come back and adopted. So speaking about draft bylaws, um, if you go out for consultation on a draft bylaw, 
I'm assuming that you can have a more comprehensive or broader range of options, and it gives you the option upon feedback to potentially narrow those or modify depending on what you went out with. However, I, you know, because I'm thinking about these three options that are widely discussed, desexing, microchipping, registration, and which are referenced in the um, Environment Committee report to government. Um, if you just went out in a draft bylaw with, say, um, registration in the Animal Companion, and you didn't include microchipping or desexing, is it difficult retroactively then to kind of put those things into a bylaw if you didn't go out with them in the draft? Would it, would be, would it be unusual to try to retroactively put them in if you hadn't gone out with them in the draft? Yes, yeah, so through the chair, that would be problematic because then those items that people may have um, submitted on aren't, aren't there. So um, if it was to change quite materially from what went out, then we'd need to consider perhaps a second round of consultation. Okay, um, so on that basis, I um, sent through an amendment. I think it's really important that the draft by law consider comprehensive options um, so that we have those uh, options for the community to comment on and then can develop um, a, you know, by law once we've had the um, consideration. And I'm wondering if, um, I, I know that there was some concern when I sent it through that it might be a predetermination. I changed the wording slightly and I, I just really want to, um, I guess, test with staff whether that um, would yeah, not be predetermination, but just enable all the options to be considered by the community? I'd be perfectly open to the amendment that I am, like Rachel, uh, Councillor Sanson, interested in your advice relative to the legal process of developing the bylaw. Is the amendment that Councillor Sanson suggests helpful or uh, does it compromise um, the legal process that Council must go through around the consultation on the bylaw? So, yes. Um, Changing that resolution, which considers desexing and white tripping, is is fine. And I don't think it predetermines anything, um, but it's clear in the report. I don't think it's necessary. It's clear in the in the report that officers will be considering those things as part of the the draft bylaw, and we also intend to go out for a pre-consultation engagement. So this, so a draft bylaw doesn't just land on people to seek their views about whether they would support the inclusion of these things. Um, so, yes, yeah. I'm not hey, sure what needs to be in a resolution because... That's the only thing I felt was... Can, that the, can I just yeah. respond? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sure. That's really great. My understanding is as well is that this is... We are the governance table and this is a report coming to us and one of our roles and functions is to give guidance. And I think that, um, you know, from my perspective, and I know there are a number... Um, around the table, and obviously it will be tested um, on, you know, vote through the democratic process, but um, that there isn't, uh, you know. I'm, I'm genuinely very relaxed about this. I think it's inherent, and so the question is, uh, is being explicit about what you want to consider helpful to the resolution? Uh, I'm very relaxed as to the, the views of councillors. I took it inherently that those were the, the two key issues in the, both in the paper and the like. If, if officers are saying that it's uh, not a difficulty, I'm quite reckless about including it, but would appreciate comments of other councillors. Thanks. And so I'm just indicating that in, in appropriate um, form, I'd like to yeah. move that whenever it's appropriate. Uh, uh, Councillor Stella. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I support the intent. Um, I just did a question about process. So TDC having a workshop. So if we pass a resolution today, and at a later time, will we also have a workshop to give guidance before the draft by law goes out for consultation? Yes, and yeah. So uh, through, through the chair, yes, that's correct, because um, our pre-engagement, the results of that will be brought to council in a workshop and then 
to identify what would be included in the draft bylaw? Um, I missed Councillor Brain, sorry. I'll get back to you, um, Councillor Stallard, but I did actually indicate to... Oh, OK. Finish, um, Councillor Stallard. Oh, you one. Um, so that would be the appropriate time for guidance around and so on. So, yeah, um, I mean, uh, given that information, I'm not sure this is necessary. I'm, I'm assured that we're not ruling anything out at this point, and maybe if we do include it, maybe the wording would be changed a little because it seems to say the bylaw itself will consider, but it's more about our process considers, I think. So... Maybe that needs to be have some thought given to it. Apologies, Councillor Brain. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, through the Mayor. Um, so just coming back to we talked about. I'm glad you mentioned pre-engagement there. Um, I was starting to wonder if we were going to do any pre-engagement because it always refers to Tasman District Council in this report, and I just sort of wondered if we're just following what they're doing without seeking our own engagement with our community. So my question then is, with that pre-engagement, is one of the questions asking them if they want to proceed with a CAP bylaw? Um, the, what we were thinking of doing is, is uh, essentially following the questions that Tasman District Council did ask, and that was initially um, what um, people would like to see in a bylaw, give them the option, and then there was sort of an open question about um, comments that they may have about the process. So that could be anything from if they had concerns about the cost, for example, or they weren't, didn't want a bylaw at all or any any constraints around it. So there would, would be an open um, comment part of the, of the survey. So we're going out with pre-engagement on the assumption that we're doing a bylaw and then the open question at the end, if they have any other comment, is whether or not they wish to have a bylaw. So through the chair, I think the pre-engagement would be council is considering um, a cat management bylaw and then ask the questions. Okay. So I just want to get it clear, because we haven't actually asked our community if they want the bylaw <laughs> officially through any pre-engagement or consultation. And we're sort of, how I read the answers that are being provided and the conversations taking place, that we're assuming that this is just going ahead and we're doing a bylaw and therefore the pre-engagement is about what types of things would our community wish to include in the bylaw. Therefore, we're making a fundamental flaw right at the start because we haven't actually clarified if our community want the bylaw in the first place. I think we're a little bit bound by legislative process in that the... Local government under an act of which we make bylaws requires us to go that additional step. And so uh, effectively we're saying um, we think there's sufficient merit to ask the question of the community. And then we get the response from the community for that next step. Uh, now, the only question I had in terms of process is I am as keen as possible to work in parallel with Tasman. Our communities are very engaged. What is the potential... Uh, for either the workshop to be joined with our Tasman friends, uh, what is the potential for us potentially to delegate the decision on the bylaw uh, to a joint committee uh, of the two councils? Uh, are they legal options that we have available to us if there was an intent uh, to move down this track in parallel? Uh, so I don't think so because the, the bylaws have to be set for each yeah. Each authority. So, yeah. So my, uh, subject to where, where other councillors are at, my view would be I'd like us to work in parallel as closely as the law allows between Nelson and Tasman. Uh, the by cat ball by law, if we go down that road, is very much in line with our joint pest management strategy, and so I think there are real benefits there. Uh, but there will be legislative limits as to how far you go. I suspect you can do a joint workshop. I suspect the final decision on the bylaws will need to be with council. But can I just sort of test the views of, of councillors that we are keen to do this as much as in parallel as the legally allowed with our neighbours in Tasman? Are people pretty comfortable with that? You're not comfortable with that? I'm very comfortable working very close to them, but as we've shown in the past, they have quite different requirements when it comes to uh, cats being pests in their rural areas, we don't have that same. 
pocket issue. So that's it's okay. one of the few times, one of the very few times I'd say, no, actually, they've got quite a different issues. They need different mm -hmm. tools. And our public have never come to us asking for this. We have obviously directed as a council. I understand that, which is where we are today. As a oh. council, we've directed. To did, did I hear you say, Councillor Skinner, that our community has never come to us asking for this? We've uh, had because because I, I we've to... had individuals come up, and well, I remember, and I'm, I don't know if it was this term or this term. We had a veterinary representative, oh, and yes. I was very disappointed because we had Hans Anderson, who was previously presented and said, "No, um, the veterinary association did not support um, right. that." And I remember quizzing at the time, and there was quite there was a little bit of difference of um, opinion on what the stance of that was. But I understand various concerns. I'm not got land. We yeah. don't worry about pests, sure. etc. But that's outside of the Nelson. Oh, look, I just need to be very clear as mayor. I've been approached by a number of groups that have advocated a view. Not saying they agree with them, but I'm, there's certainly been advocacy to my level as mayor. It's not the first time we've gone to the public yeah. on this and it's come back and we've turned it down because of public input. I'm happy the, for the process. The, the, process the take from that is that there are some, some different views about that, that and that's okay. Um, are there any other questions for officers? Uh, Councillor Sanson. Sorry, you'd asked about joint workshops with TDC, and yep. I just wanted to... I, uh, my understanding is that TDC is already ahead of us. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm not sure whether um, it would be beneficial for either council. I know that staff are working super closely. I think we yep. probably benefit for us is to try to um, keep up with them. Yep. Um, and um, I, I also just, um, I didn't want to do a point of order, but, you know, we have had uh, several entreaties from broad representatives across the community for a number of years over this. So I think we just need to be careful about making blanket well, statements correction, we've that had this more hasn't people come, come from the community. It, so we're and I don't purposes. think there's evidence to that statement either. So sure. I just think that's really important we have kind of evidence-based um, conversations around the table. Good as gold. Uh, I've got a comment from uh, Councillor Benj, who's been sitting there very patiently on Zoom. Uh, Matthew, floor is yours. Thank you. Mayor Nick? We can hear you loud and clear. Great. I just want to point out, TDC did a survey of cat owners, and um, it turned out that if memory serves me, it was around 80% are already microchipped and registered. And they made the point that the cat owners are actually ahead of us on this. We, we are behind. Um, people are already doing this. We did have a vet submit to us who said that their veterinary service spent around 100000 a year on D6 and cats. And they were wondering why they should bother because there was no law about these these things. You know, why are they spending all this money? But I have to also point out we have hundreds, hundreds of volunteers who trap mustelids, possums, all these things so that it gives the birds a chance to breed. And we do nothing about cats. It, it is just, you know, our birds still do not understand that they can't fly down and sit on the ground. And we add to that the Brook Reserve, which has had a increase of numbers of cats around it. And of course, we've created an environment where a pet of birds can raise fledglings. They can go down to the ground, learn to fly, learn to eat, and so forth. And then one day, as they get bigger, they sit on the fence and they see more ground, more food outside, which is natural. That there is because it doesn't have a large bird population, and basically we're feeding cats with the rock reserve. Um, and then there's this delineation between feral and stray. When a lizard or a skink or a moth or a bat or a bird gets eaten by its cat, it doesn't care whether it's feral or stray, it's eaten by a cat. So I think there is president in Nelson and and the willingness to want to do something about this and I think we need to catch up with TDC and and do our bit. Thank you. Thanks Councillor Benj. I, 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 look this is a, um, an issue of which there will be different opinions. 
uh, and I want to facilitate a healthy debate. Uh, but I'm just going to be a little bit more conservative in saying this is the phase for questions, uh, but I equally want to assure councillors uh, that I am going to provide uh, the opportunity for a healthy debate on it. So if there are further questions for our officers on the recommendation, Councillor Courtney and then Councillor Stella. Thank you, Mayor Nick. And following on from your remarks, just a, a question a few minutes ago, can I go back to Richard through you and ask him, how confident are you that you can work so closely with uh, TDC that our two bylaws will be aligned? For me, that's important. Um, I'm confident that we're working very closely together as far as the time frames and the issues around um, uh, that, that have arisen from that TDC's engagement. That's why I think it's important for us to undertake our own, just sort of as a bit of a test to see if the same concerns are held in Nelson community as there are in Tasman. Um, as, and as far as the timing goes, then, um, yeah, it's, we, all we can do is just match their time frame as much as possible. Um, we hope to get out uh, a survey as, as, as soon as possible after the decision's made today. Um, but I, I guess um, it's always difficult to know because... The, 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 each council has to make its own decision. So, you know, I, all I can do is sort of work with, with staff and work through the process. Uh, at the end of the day, it's really up to the councillors, both councils, to, to determine the extent of uh, whether they agree to the same provisions in the bylaw or not. So, yes, it's difficult to answer that question, councillor. Can I just add that, that at our level, we have really strong relationships with our counterparts at Tasman, and we talk daily on things like the, the regional pest management plan and cap provisions and, and all manner of things under the environment. So at our level, we're working really closely, and we'll do as much as we can to keep us together. Um, when it comes to decision-making, that's up to you lot. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Stallard. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor. Just quickly, the report states that it seems that Section 146 of the Local Government Act talks about bylaws around the keeping of animals, and most commonly it's to do with nuisance and threats to human health. And the report states that perhaps seldom or not previously before there have been bylaws around biodiversity protection. Just, just checking we are free to make that kind of bylaw with that aim. We're not bound by a narrower scope under the legislation in terms of the way our outcome, the desired outcome is? Uh, yeah, the two key points that, that you mentioned, Councillor, around the, uh, the public nuisance aspect and the public health um, side of things, we can't make a bylaw based around um, concerns of impact on biodiversity. Um, that's why we're going through the process for the Pest management plan to include provisions for feral and stray cats. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. To clarify, what is our ultimate goal of this bylaw? Is it around nuisance or health or? Uh, it will be to address, first of all, we need to identify the problem, and that's around nuisance or public health aspects of, of cats. Um, and then the bylaw will uh, need to address those issues. Any final questions for officers? Otherwise, I will say thank you for your presentation and uh, solid answering your questions, and then I'll be good cop and say we're going to break for lunch um, and be back at one thirty for debate. So we are adjourned for lunch. Rohan, just before we do, I signal that I'd like to move this. Yes. So can I move it? You can move it. The standing orders allow you to move whenever Thanks. you want and to do move. do I have a seconder? Councillor Pakipaki, all right. That is moved and second, so we now know what we'll be debating at 1.30. Thank you. Just I thought it would be helpful and so just can a reminder, we'll be next arguments. door at 1.00.
reaction of questions uh, on the proposal for a CAP bylaw. The resolution has been moved by Councillor Sanson and seconded by Councillor Pakipaki and is now open for debate. And I'd ask Councillor Sanson whether she wishes to uh, use her um, opportunity to speak now or would she prefer to use it later in the debate? Thanks, Ben. I'll hold. I'll speak last if that's OK. I'm happy to uh, speak from the chair. And can I just share a, a, a broader perspective on this? During the period of which I was Environment Minister, uh, I often attended uh, international forums in different corners of the world in which there were often presentations about the quality of the environment. And I was quite proud so often when they talked of issues of the standard of your oceans or your quality of your water, your air quality, in so many of those things of which New Zealand was just almost always in the top ten. And the one that just sticks out so badly that too few New Zealanders appreciate is that New Zealand's record around biodiversity uh, puts us right at the bottom of the world, not because we've been particularly bad, but because of New Zealand's unique geological history. We have been completely isolated. We have this treasure chest of native species. And the sort of tragedy of history uh, is that they are a group of species that have had no predators. And we, last century, the big environmental debate was around uh, the protection of areas so that we would stop clear felling forests and draining wetlands and those things, and that was quite proper. Actually, the biggest threat this century to the uh, native uh, plants and animals that make New Zealand so special uh, are predators and pests. Now, it's been an awkward conversation, uh, and I led a decade ago the battle for our birds, in which the big discussion was around pests like possums and stoats. And it is an uncomfortable conversation to have around cats because so many, including my household, have a beloved moggy. Uh, and we sort of want to turn a blind eye to the fact that there are 2.5 million estimated feral cats in New Zealand that are continuously... Um, munching uh, away at our native species, particularly our native birds, but also our nascent lizards and other things. And so the reason I'm so supportive of, of us making progress on a cat by law is because of the related work with the pest management strategy that we're developing with the Tasman Council. Because here's the really hard practical bit. If we want to go after, and literally there are thousands, and I suspect tens of thousands, of feral cats in the region, that live a very miserable life, that live off our native birds and native species, is that if we want to make any progress on them, we create this really difficult dilemma for staff trying to differentiate between where have I trapped the feral cat and when have I trapped the household moggy. And the only practical way to be able to address that is for us to move down the road of microchipping. Uh, and I think alongside it, when I talk to our vets and the SPCA about the number of unwanted litters of kittens, uh, then I come to the practical view that we need to make some progress. Now, there will always be those that are opposed to extra regulation. Uh, and actually, with the other favourite people's pet, the dog, we require them to be fully registered. Now, I don't think, uh, and some have suggested going down that path, uh, no, I think that's a, an overstretch, uh, but I think these options around desexing and microchipping are quite sensible. I want to stress today that for the community, this is just the first step. This is simply saying we're going to ask our officers to develop a bylaw. We're committing to a full process of consultation. I'm quite interested in making sure we get the time frames right, making sure that we kick the tyres uh, and get the community engaged about uh, how we go down the road of this bylaw. Uh, but I'm very supportive of us making uh, this first step. And I'm particularly enthusiastic that we are doing it in parallel with the best veterinary advice and with organisations that I hugely respect, like the uh, RSPCA, uh, who do good work around um, animal welfare. Uh, so they are the reasons why I'm supporting this piece of work, albeit... I want to make sure there's a really good process of consultation as we go forward. And the last part I'd say is I'm super enthusiastic 
about doing this piece of work jointly with Tasman. When I look at that border through the Richmond Hills and around the coastal area uh, of the Waimea Inlet, if we're going to move on this stuff, actually our issues are very similar and it's going to be so much more practical for the community if the rules in Richmond are the same as what they are in the adjoining Stoke. And they are the reasons that I'm supportive of the resolution that's been moved by Councillor Sampson and seconded by Councillor Packy Packy. Others? Uh, Councillor Stella. Yeah, just a procedural point. Like, Are we currently debating the amendment or is that being... Uh, oh, that's a very good question. I should have dealt with it at the point. Uh, I am the motion that has been moved and seconded is that which is on the screen, including the amendment. Uh, over to the Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Ben. Uh, about 20 20 ish months ago, um, a few of us were having this uh, discussion first up in, our, in the great weekly mayoral debate. And whilst I'm intransigent enough to have not changed my views, uh, I'm grateful that there's been a d development in, in some views on this issue because I think uh, when we look, New Zealand has uh, the highest rate of cat ownership. Um, we are a country that loves its cats. Uh, I dearly, dearly adore my own uh, feline friend. I don't know why I'm getting up to so much alliteration, but we'll see if that continues. Uh, but what we also, we're also a country that harbours some of the greatest biodiversity in the world and the greatest diversity um, there. And it's something that we are rightfully proud of and also something that we should rightfully protect. Um, starting this conversation, uh, well, the start didn't happen today. It's been going on in our community. We've received countless submissions and emails and requests to consider this. And whilst there are a range of views, I'm really heartened by uh, the numbers coming from the pre-engagement over in Tasman that shows how far this conversation has come to the acceptance that actually if we want to have natural predators as our friends, uh, we should also have naturally reasonable uh, legislation and rules uh, to guide how we manage them and particularly manage the impact that feral cats have on our environment. Um, we've done things through our sort of good cat ownership uh, guidelines um, to try and nudge people in the right direction. But actually, if we want to be able to deal with those issues around trapping, around not wanting uh, to put uh, beloved pets in uh, uncomfortable, if not deadly situations, um, then we actually need a way to differentiate between them. Um, and so uh, this is a positive step. It's also one that a number of councils have already taken and a significant number more are looking to take, including registration. Um, and where we land in terms of that policy suite, uh, we'll see, and, and there is obviously a full process of engagement and consultation to go from here. Um, but I think that as in our role as, as stewards and guardians of uh, of the whenua here and, and the role that's been placed on us by our community, I think we can't turn a blind eye to what we know is a significant threat when we have some really practical common sense measures that could reduce the number of unwanted pets, that could uh, reduce the strain on great organisations like the SPCA whilst providing those who do great conservation work with more tools to be able to manage what is a very real uh, possibility. We, we talked about wanting to, uh, in previous terms, about wanting to have a, a city that sings, having bird life return mm -hmm. and, and flourish in our urban areas. Um, and I think that that's a reality that has wide buy-in in our community. And if we want to make that happen, we need more common steps, in, uh, common sense steps like this one here. So I'm very supportive. Any other colleagues that would make a contribution? Councillor Bench, you've expressed an interest if you wanted to contribute to the debate. I know during the question period you expressed a number of views on it. Very relaxed. Uh, Councillor Paki Paki. Just a question to the chairs. Uh, the motion is second to when. Uh, I'll just go now. Here we go. Go away. So uh, this is this is a pretty much a no brainer for me. Um, the intent when when we were first discussing this, obviously the the intent is 
uh, um, you know, that, that we we have we've identified an issue. We had some really good expert advice came from the SPCA. They presented a compelling argument. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Benz really highlighted that in terms of you know the, the community's uh, uh, actions, even without this bylaw, indicates that they they believe that the sexing and and the microchipping of uh, of cats um, is is an important thing. So I mean, just simply by their participation in this so far, it clearly shows that that we have the community on board. There obviously there may be some of the community that aren't happy with that, but I'd just like to. Uh, remind us just in terms of our position, uh, we we do share a, share a very narrow book boundary with with Tasman and their um, uh, situation um, and their um, the dynamics of that they have to deal with with their rural areas are quite different to ours. But that uh, the purpose of this was to try and align our bylaws so that 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 they at least meet at that joining point. But I, I remind the uh, our members here that. Uh, we can do what we need to do within our own territory, and uh, and it, it seems to me that because of the uh, the nature of that that boundary, it's not something that's too significant um, that we can't overcome. Um, so I'm really in support of this. Um, I, I I see it as one of the steps that's needed to uh, achieve what the deputy mayor uh, mentioned as being able to have birdsong back. I, I don't think it goes. Um, far enough to to be the sole contributor to that. Um, so, uh, but at least it really gives an indication that this council um, is working towards that as a goal, and um, I think it's really highly commendable. So, not either. Then I'll put it. Thanks, Councillor Pakitaki. Councillor Anderson. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll go. Uh, if Councillor Anderson will indulge me, we'll have Councillor Benj from um, Zoom, and then we'll come to Councillor Anderson. Floor is yours, Matthew. Thank you, Nick. Sorry, I um, was clicking on the wrong thing. When you asked me before, I, I, really had my, I really had my say before when you invited me, and even if it did turn out to be in question time. Um, but I think this is something that we just have to do as a nation if we want to save our birds. They're nearly all ground feeding. Um, it just doesn't work. They just don't go hand in hand. With respect to TDC, when we had the discussions with them, the biggest issue they had was making it, making feral cats illegal, was with their rural properties. And they seem to have overcome that somehow. They, they were worried that holders of large tracts of land could be fined for having a feral cat on it when it was sort of impractical for them to be asked to clear several thousand acres of, of land of feral cats. So th that that was sort of their biggest issue. We don't have that issue. So I, I, I don't see any upcoming problems with us uh, being aligned or, or putting this into place. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Benj. Floor is Councillor Anderson's. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Nick. Um... Te koi koi, oh, e koi koi te tui, e te kite te kaka, e kuku te keredu, the tui chatters, the kaka, what does it do? Squawks and the um, keredu coos. Um, <laughs> so that, that's Whakatoki and it's, it's I, I think it's has a bit to do with um, engagement and whatnot, so lots of different voices and we all matter. I, I um, agree with Councillor Benj. I love birds in Nelson, and it's green, and I love working in the backyard and um, in the garden, and the fantails are flitting around, and the old woof, 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 it's the kid who flies above you. And this is in town. Um, I, I, I think this is a great first. It's just a great first step. Nothing to be scared of, and we'll, we'll just see what happens. Thanks, Councillor Anderson. Any further contributions? Would the mover like to exercise your right of reply? I think Campbell had his hand up. I'm sorry, did I overlook it, Canon Torello? Yeah, look, I wasn't going to speak anything, but um, randomly this um, bylaw um, means a lot to me because it has always crossed my mind why Nelson City Council gives funding to a sanctuary, a, a wildlife park, for them to bring nature back to us, yet the City Council allows anyone who owns or has a cat 
to do what they like. And I would, I, I, I've heard the, the comment here that I oh, will, Tasman's much more of a rural community and maybe it doesn't align to us and maybe that's what a city is. So an area where lots of houses are and an area where there is a rural part too, noting that we do have uh, north of Nelson. Um, and, you know, I won't say much more than that, that I'm, I'm so glad that this is happening because it's a um, leading example and it also shows to the people that we go out and give money to every year to say, hey, bring wildlife back to Whakatū Nelson. Actually, we're now going to give you a bit more assistance in a way of not allowing cats just to roam around for free. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Councillor Rollo. Uh, Councillor Sanson. Um, thanks, Mayor Nick, through the chair. Um, first of all, I'd just really like to acknowledge the staff who have done such great work on this to date and are working so closely with TD staff, TDC staff on that. So, yeah, really want to um, acknowledge you. Um, I also think it's great that we are aligning with TDC in terms of our timing. You know, um, they are a wee bit ahead of us. We'll be catching up to them. That's great. However, I'm not sure that we need to be identically aligned with TDC in terms of the actual contents of the bylaw. We have an example of this already with the uh, regional pest management strategy where for Nelson, all council public land, um, you're going to be able to, um, you know, feral, tr feral cats will be seen as a, um, are going to be denoted as a pest. However, with TDC, it's so large, it's got, you know, so much um, public and pri large tracts of public and private land, I think as um, Councillor Benj referred to, it seemed impractical. But, you know, we have a really similar approach yeah. with slight variance. And I think for Nelson, it's really important that we signal to our community and to TDC ahead of their workshop on the 21st of May that at the governance table, we are seriously considering desexing and microchipping, that for us they go hand in hand with reducing the impact and the nuisance and the human risk of cats. Um, I note that the Parliamentary Environment Committee has recently made a recommendation um, uh, that there should be, a, you know, the principle that cats should be registered, desexed and microchipped with appropriate exemptions for breeders. Um, we've heard from the SPCA, we know that companion cat organisations support this approach. So, um, yeah, I just um, think that now is the time. I think our community has moved on a lot and I really look forward to hearing from them through the pre-consultation what their view is on the possibility of a bylaw and... Um, the potential of a very comprehensive bylaw which covers desexing and microchipping as well as the um, register. And I'd just like to have a personal vote on this, you know, division personal vote. Thanks. Okay. Uh, uh, that being the right reply. Um, no, no, no. I made plain. I made plain from the beginning that the resolution was was as amended. Uh, put that to the vote. Um, I've had a request, which I, I understand I must accept. I don't, I, I'm sort of... It's, it's important, Nick, we've, had, we've revisited this issue so many times that I feel for staff to give them clarity that there is, you know, really strong support around the table for this, that it's... It's such a vote. good collegial environment, I'm not going to say what yeah. I was going to say. No, it's not, and it's, <laughs> it's not anti-collegial. Uh, uh, an I'll put, I'll an electronic you. voting system would <laughs> remove this altogether. Oh, I'm going backwards today. Uh, let's have a, ask the Chief Executive to cast a, uh, a, a division. No. Okay. Okay. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Bench, online. Aye. Councillor Brand. Aye. Councillor Courtney. Aye. Councillor Hobson. Aye. Councillor Pakipaki. Vote to call. Aye. Councillor Rainey. Aye. Aye. Councillor Rollo. Aye. Councillor Sanderson. Aye. Councillor Skinner. No. Councillor Stard. Aye. Deputy Mayor. Aye. Mayor Nick. Aye. Carries. Okay, we come to item number 11 on the agenda, um, which is the uh, latest update. Invite Alec Lavertis uh, before the committee. Um, myself and other members of the Storm Recovery Task Force uh, took the opportunity with Councillor Brand uh, and with Councillor Anderson yesterday 
to have a look at some of the practical work that's being done out in the field. And I think all three of us uh, came away impressed and encouraged uh, by the positive work that is being done. Uh, I need to say to uh, Alan and his team, if you ask me 18 months into the job, uh, after the August 22 storm, would I have thought we would have been in as good a shape as we are with the complexity and difficulty of issues? Uh, we are in great shape, and that is largely down to your leadership and your team. And I want to acknowledge that generously at the beginning of the presentation of your report. Um, thank you, Manik. Um, I will take the report as read. I'll just update um, item 4.2 on page 59. Um, hot off the press, um, there are now nine red properties. And while the yellows remain the same, um, there are 12 yellow twos and 49 yellow ones. Um, that is the only minor change to the report. Um, I will say that um, I think that the recovery is tracking well on all fronts. Um, and I am particularly happy in terms of the progress we are making, um, especially with the work out on site, dealing with the insurances, um, and I think overall, um, I, we, 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 we should be happy with uh, as to where we are. I agree with you, Nick. If you had asked me 18 months ago as to whether we'd be here, I would have been surprised that we would have been um, tracking so well. Um, that said, I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, the dashboards are attached at the back. There's one recommendation, um, and I'm proposing that this will be the uh, the last uh, quarterly report to this council, and then we'll just include this in as business as usual in the infrastructure six monthly reports going forward. Same format, same dashboards, um, and there will still be a reporting mechanism through to council. So happy to to take any questions. Councillor Rollins. Thanks, Ben, Nick, and, and thanks, Alec. Great report. I asked this question um, a few months ago, and I'll ask it again purely because it just gets me a little bit worried, and it's under insurances 5.5. Uh, 5. Um, can give you the page 59. Um, noting that through, um, we're still waiting on a large amount there from Waka Kotahi. Um, are we making any progress in actually getting any further funding out of them, or is that still a large amount that we're um, just holding on that we're hoping to get? Uh, it's a very good question. No, I can say that we are working very, very well with uh, NZTA at the moment. I need to provide uh, additional information to them. And as I indicated to the Recovery Task Force, I have committed to making sure that I have that information to them within the next two weeks. Um, I, I just need to cover off format that they require, and I've got staff working on that. And there are no indications that uh, we are not going to get some funding. So. I think it's been um, a little bit of a mix-up between, in terms of what I thought they wanted, what they wanted, and where we ended up. But we're on the same page now. I know what they need, and I've got staff working on that. Within the next weeks, we'll have that submitted. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Sanson. A, a comment, if I may, rather than a question? Certainly. Um, I think it's been said before, but I just really want to acknowledge Alec you and your team and I think, you know, those involved, maybe um, the Deputy Mayor in particular, who were involved in um, engagement and negotiations with um, families up the brook around the buyout. You know, I know that was a, when we first heard about it, it was, I would say, a harrowing um, discovery and we were all just super concerned about the impact for the um, families and, um, you know, I f feel like it has gone unbelievably smoothly. In some ways, it almost um, is an example for how to deal with some of these situations around the country. And I know that that is really a tribute to you, Alec, and your team and the way you've sensitively deal dealt with the families. Um, you know, there's been story about it and all good so far and I've seen comment you know chatter on social media and I haven't seen anything negative so I think it's kind of remarkable for something which could have really um gone differently so yeah just really you know, acknowledge that to everybody involved totally endorse those comments about Brook Street just so that councillors are aware and I'm happy to take feedback on this 
As Alex said, the intention is for future storm recovery reports to be included as part of the six monthly infrastructure reports. It is my intention to maintain the task force that's overseeing the recovery work for a further year. Uh, we would be, in my view, if I look at the finances, Alec, we're about 25% through the work. I also think we've got a couple of key milestones. We need to get through the long-term plan consultation process. After we do that, we then have the oversight of concluding the agreement with government. Uh, and then uh, we've got still the complexity, which I hope it goes as smoothly as Councillor Sanson has pointed out, on the public to private, on the private to private land negotiations. And so I do think it will be important for that task force to continue to function during the 24 5 financial year. And then I'm sort of indicating if all is smooth July 25, then I would probably see the task force concluding its work and becoming very much business as usual from then. If there is feedback uh, from councillors, whether you're comfortable with that level and process uh, for the oversight of this work from here, uh, not necessarily today, but just as we make decisions going through uh, into the next financial year of 25, 20, 24, 25. There being no further comments, then I'll move from the chair. Would Matty, as a uh, member of the task force, be prepared to second the resolution? So it's been moved and seconded by myself and Councillor Anderson. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. And again, thank you, Alec, for the work. We now have concluded the uh, public section of the business and moved to the confidential agenda. Uh, is there a, I'm sorry, Councillor Pakabaki. No. You would be happy to move that we move into confidential business. Thank you, Councillor Paki Paki. Uh, seconded from Councillor Skinner. Uh, is there any debate on that resolution? That being the case, I shall put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. We'll just take a two minute break while we allow the session to be reset up and for Councillor Bench to be able to come back in on the private session. And you may have to take a little bit of time.